Okay, folks, good evening and welcome to the May 15th uh, edition of your Albuquerque City Council meeting. All of our councilors are present or will be with us uh, before we get to our action items this evening. Like all meetings, we begin our meeting with a moment of silence and our pledge. Madam Vice President. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, at this time, I'd like us all to stand, uh, take a moment of silence to um, think about those up in Farmington and then... Um, Pledge of Allegiance by Councillor Jones and Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish by Councillor Pena. Thank you. Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Just a, a point of privilege here to introduce uh, some, uh, some personnel changes in the lineup. Uh, this will be the last meeting for Chris Melendrez as our City Council Services Director. Uh, Chris is taking another position uh, in government here locally, and uh, we want to introduce sitting next to him is Julian Moya, who's our new Acting Director, and we want to welcome Julia, Julian and say thank you to Chris for all your years of service, and, and we appreciate you. And we're gonna send you off with a six or eight hour meeting tonight just for old time's sake, so yay. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen, and, uh, and welcome, Julian, congratulations. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Councilor Davis. I just would like to recognize Chris as well and just thank him for his, his, his service. It's just amazing, you know, he has a lot of personalities up here and um, we all have different ideas and different ways of thinking and, and sometimes different mindsets. And Chris has been amazing in how he keeps everything separate and just makes sure that all of our separate needs are met. And I just want to commend um, Chris Belendris in, in a job well done. You're going to be very, very hard to replace. And um, I'd just like to give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank too you. late, Madam Vice President. Maybe next time we'll make a Chris Melendrez Day or something in the city. We can kind of do that. That's a good idea. So we can do that. It'll make him come back even. So. <laughs> Thank you. Civic Plaza parking passes are provided for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from council staff at the table near the chamber entrance. Members of the public, city staff, and the media have the ability to view this meeting in person and on live streams through four different platforms. Gov TV on Comcast Channel 16, the Gov TV website, YouTube, and Zoom webinar. The live streams can be accessed from most smartphones, tablets, or computers. Also, this meeting is closed captioned, and you may enable the ca closed captioning services on your television um, or device at this time. The video recording of this and all past council meetings will remain available for viewing at any time on the City Council's website. Council staff is available via telephone if members of the public need assistance finding the videos online. Please call 505-768-3100 for assistance during business hours Monday through Friday, 8 to 5 p.m. The council will take a break at approximately 7 p.m. this evening if needed. With regard to decorum in the chambers, we want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. Please do not make any personal attacks, and please no applause or other outbursts during the meeting. The meeting will go a lot smoother if we are all respectful of one another. Proclamations and presentations. Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Councillor Grout. The proclamation is being signed. We have a few copies, but um, I have one. And uh, do you have your side? I do. Um, I am going to read um, first, second, third, fourth, whereas, if you could start on the fifth one. You got it. And that was the whereas 443. Okay. And what is this proclamation for, Councillor Sanchez? This is a proclamation um, for 
Albuquerque Police Week. Um, this is the week once a year where all police officers honor their fallen in Washington, D.C. It's quite the ceremony. Um, every police officer that can make it will make it. They'll dress in their Class A uniform. There's a lot of different activities that take place during police week. And it's just basically honoring the ultimate sacrifice that police officers give um, while they're in the line of duty. Each officer goes to work every single day not knowing if they're going to come back to their families. And this is why we honor the fallen, because some of those officers did not make it back to their families. And Councillor Sanchez, um, I think we have uh, Dolores Duran, Charles Poole, Tom Grover, Jim Lerner, Bob Kuhn, Lou Black, Brian McCutcheon, and Vince Harrison um, here to, pres uh, to accept this pr proclamation. If you all come forward. Okay, I still thought, Rita, were you going to come on up, or? <laughs> Who else did I see? There's Brian, and any else? anybody else that we missed? Okay, so these are the folks from the FOP, and every year, the Albuquerque Police Department um, Union, the APOA, will send a contingent to um, the uh, National Police Week in Washington, and so will the FOP. So these are the individuals who actually stayed back because we are in the middle of police week right now. Um, you can jump on the internet and you can see what's going on right now in police week. And it's something really, really special to see. Um, thousands upon thousands of officers across the whole United States converge in Washington during this day. And you can actually take a marker and use a pencil and a stencil to actually record your fallen officer if you'd like. Um, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and read um, the proclamation, the first half of it. Whereas from the beginning of this nation, law enforcement officers have played an important and integral role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms which are guaranteed by the Constitution and in protecting the lives and property of American citizens. Pre excuse me, President John F. Kennedy issued a proclamation on May 4th, 1963, which was also passed by the Congress designating May 15th of every year as National Police Officers Memorial Day in honor of those courageous deeds of perform performed by police officers, specifically honoring those who lost their lives or became disabled in the line of duty. As such, every calendar week that includes May, May 15th is officially known as Police Week and Whereas the Congress and the President of the United States have designated May 15th, 2023 as National Police Officers Memorial Day and the week in which it falls, May 14th through the 20th, 2023, as National Police Week. And whereas the members of the Fraternal Order of Police and Auxiliary of the Albuquerque Lodge 1 and the law enforcement officers of the Albuquerque Police Department and all officers in the state of New Mexico play an essential role in safeguarding the rights and freedoms of the citizens of Albuquerque and New Mexico. And whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the problems, duties, responsibilities of their police officers and that police officers recognize their duty to protect and serve the people by safeguarding life and property, protecting them against violence and disorder, protecting them against deception and protecting the weak against oppression and intimidation and whereas 563 peace officers and their surviving families will be honored on may 15th in the nation's capital in re remembrance of our fallen father brothers and sisters who made the supreme sacrifice in the line of duty and whereas three new mexico peace officers will be honored and remembered on may 15th 2023 in washington dc including Corporal Thomas Wade Frazier of the Artesia Police Department, 
Patrolman Darian Ray Jarrett of the New Mexico State Police, and Under Sheriff Jeffrey Mark Montoya of the Colfax County Sheriff's Office, New, Me New Mexico's Fallen, will never be forgotten. Whereas peace officers in Albuquerque and throughout the state of New Mexico leave their families every day not knowing whether they will return home after their shifts, providing vital public service. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Albuquerque City Council does hereby proclaim May 15th, 2023 as National Peace Officers Memorial Day and May 11 through 17, 2023 as Police Week in the city of Albuquerque. This council calls upon all citizens of Albuquerque and patriotic, um, civil, and educational organizations to observe this day and week with appropriate ceremonies in which all people may join in commemorating police officers past and present. Officers who, by their faithful and loyal devotion to their duties and responsibilities, have rendered a dedicated service to their communities, and in doing so, having established for themselves an invaluable and enduring reputation of preserving rights and security for all citizens. Thank you very much for your service to our community. Appreciate you. With that, if would you like to say a few words? The only thing I would say is that we have a, quite a few, and there was actually six people that were recognized in uh, Washington today. Okay. Our vice president, our president, and many members of our FOP auxiliary are present there representing New Mexico, escorting family members from across the United States to the memorial, and they spend a lot of time there at their own expense. So thank you for recognizing law enforcement. Obviously, all of us are retired from law enforcement. So thank you we so much. Appreciate You're it. We appreciate it very, very much. You're thank welcome. you so much. Thank, thank, you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, at this time, I have a proclamation recognizing National Foster Care Month. Ann McKinney and Marilyn Beck are present to accept. Hi ladies, thank you for being here. Whereas safe, healthy children are the key to a safe, healthy future for our, our community, and whereas every child deserves to grow up in a caring and supportive home, and whereas during those unfortunate times when children cannot safely remain in their primary homes, community members who open their hearts and homes to foster children provide a vital service to our community. And whereas foster parents provide the love, safety, and stability that children need to help overcome past traumatic experiences and develop their full potential. Whereas the city of Albuquerque supports partnerships with families, child welfare staff, and public and private agencies that work to ensure that children are supported and successful. Be it proclaimed that the council, the governing body of the city of Albuquerque, hereby joins the nation in recognizing May as National Foster Family Appreciation Month and declares May 15th Foster Family Appreciation Day in honor of the foster parents who advocate for the children in their care and are helping to ensure their brightest possible futures. During this National Foster Care Month, we share our gratitude for those who support youth and families by being a resource to children in need. And can I ask Marilyn to speak a little bit about what you do and, and all that the foster um, community does in New Mexico? Thank you. Um, my name is Marilyn Beck. I'm the founder and executive director of New Mexico Child First Network. Um, and I just wanna say, um, I, I wrote something and then I wanted to share it and then I'll, I'll explain. Um, the more than 1,800 New Mexico children and youth living in foster care deserve to grow up in safe and loving homes devoted to their health and happiness and advancement. More than half of these children live here in Bernalillo County. This month, we, abs we honor the absolute courage of young people in foster care who too often endure challenges that no child should ever have to see. Um, and we give thanks 
to the kinship and foster parents who care for them during their times of greatest need. We recognize the biological parents and families of foster children who work hard to overcome difficult circumstances so they can safely reunite with their children. And we also thank you to the City Council, rededicate ourselves to supporting the volunteers and professionals who are helping New Mexico's foster youth find temporary and permanent homes. Um, it is really important to reach out to your neighborhoods and communities, to the children and youth in foster care and their family, to those at risk of entering foster care and to kin, families and other caregivers. And I just wanna say, um, what you all have done in, in really prioritizing prevention and upstream, which what we call primary prevention of the Handle with Care initiative, is one of the most profound and substantial ways that we can prevent trauma, child abuse, maltreatment, and neglect from ever happening. The children in New Mexico have the highest number of adverse childhood experiences in the entire country, um, and it will take all of us to lift this up. Last year, um, during May, there were 435 emergency 911 run reports on child abuse in the state of New Mexico alone. 435, and that's 14 911 calls a day. Um, our first responders in this room feel it every single day. And so what you all have done um, with Handle With Care, what you all have done with primary prevention, I even saw the opioid settlement funds and, and you know really prioritizing mental health. These are how we prevent it from happening but this month we celebrate those families that are caring for what happens when the worst happens. And so I also wanna leave you and invite you personally on Saturday, July 15th at Tingley Beach, um, thanks to Councillor Grout, thanks to the mayor, um, the CYFD, the Department of Game and Fish, we will be having the first annual foster care picnic at Tingley Beach to celebrate HB 35, which just passed the legislature, providing free fishing licenses for all youth and family in foster care. And so thanks to a bipartisan, by legislative chamber, I don't even know how, all the different governments working together, we have Tingley Beach reserved and all foster families in the state of New Mexico will be invited to celebrate this new law. And so thank you all, I hope you join us, fish, bring shade and water, um, and just know that there is good in this world and you are part, partially responsible for that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the hard work that you do and advocating for our children. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move on to questions and answers for the administration. Counselors, any questions for the administration? Counselor Feeblecorn? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so my questions were for the zoo. Um, they're the repeat of questions that I asked on April 27th, and I was told that I would get answers to them, but I haven't heard, so I'm gonna ask them again. Um, the first one is how many animals are being moved to Albuquerque for the Asia exhibit that is set to open up soon? Good evening, Councillor Davis. Councillor Feeblecorn, um, just bring up my notes. For the Asia opening, uh, there are no new animals coming for the Asia exhibit. All the animals that are moving into that exhibit are animals that are currently in the care of the Biopark Zoo. So that's um, one Malayan tiger, two stellar sea eagles, two snow leopards, three siamangs, and five orangutans. Thank you, Director. And when were those animals moved here? Oh, excuse me? When were they moved here? Um, Councillor Davis, Cam Councillor Fibrocorn, um, I'm not sure when each of those animals came here. Most of them have been here for several years, okay. except for the baby orangutan. She's only been here for about a year. About a year. Okay. And then same question for the Australia exhibit. I know that's further out in the future, and we probably don't have totals but I'm just wondering how many animals will be moved to Albuquerque for an exhibit that size. Um, Councillor Davis, Councillor Feeblecorn, um, Australia is actually opening in two phases and uh, because there was a lot of demolition of old spaces and construction of new spaces, most of the animals that were in those spaces were actually moved out completely. So the animals that are coming in for Australia phase one, which will be opening this summer, um, or actually that'll be opening in the late fall in November, is a mix of waterfowl species. Um, and this includes 
spotted whistling ducks, freckled ducks, hardhead pink-eared ducks, and Pacific black ducks, 12 little penguins, two terns, that's T-E-R-N-S, um, 15 to 20 uh, lorikeets, and one kookaburra. And how many of the ducks of um, each kind of duck? I don't, 10 to 15 of the different uh, total overall. of the ducks overall. Okay. That's for Australia phase one counselor. And Australia phase two? Australia phase two, uh, Councillor Davis, Councillor Feeblecorn. Um, there are three Western gray kangaroos that are currently at the zoo that will move into that exhibit. And then we're uh, expecting three additional red kangaroos and one um, echidna. Okay. And then for the heritage farm display, how many animals are being moved into that display when it's completed with the remodel that's happening? Uh, Councillor Davis, Councillor Feeblecorn. Um, I think, uh, first I'd just like to point out that the Heritage Farm, the primary focus of the Heritage Farm expansion is increased uh, walking paths and agricultural space. That's one of the major reasons and bringing back the train to the biopark. So it's, those are some of the major pieces. And in addition, we are expanding the animal barns to make them larger and expanding the pastures. We do not currently have plans to bring any additional animals in, but currently in the care of the biopark, there are five burden red turkeys, seven Navajo churro sheep, two Orloff spangled chickens, four Sicilian buttercup chickens, four black Jersey giant chickens, two Lacken Velder Creole, two black Spanish domestic chickens, and one domestic horse that are currently there. After the Heritage Farm expansion, the animal barns will um, have space for, let's see, four horses and up to three cows. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. And of all those animals that you just display, or talked about for the display for the Heritage Farm, how many of them were purchased and how many of them were adopted or rescued? Uh, Councillor Davis, Councillor Feeblecorn, um, Bugs, which is the domestic horse that we currently have uh, at the Heritage Farm, was donated and therefore adopted. Um, it was donated by Dr. Ralph Zimmerman, who is the state veterinarian um, for the state of New Mexico. Um, many of those other animals have been there for a while. The most recent uh, purchases of animals at the Heritage Farm are were six female Navajo churro sheep in May 2020 and five bourbon red turkeys in April 2021. Thank you, Madam Chair. So just to be clear, all the animals at the Heritage Farm were either purchased or donated. Um, none were actually from rescues or through the city's shelter system, which actually does take in farmed animals quite regularly, right? Uh, Councillor Davis, Council Feeblecorn. I can only, I'm sorry, I can't speak to all of those uh, animals, the sheep, and uh, I can only speak to the ones that we specifically had re recent records on. I'm sure I can find out more information for you on the other chickens and uh, sheep. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Councilor Bassan. Madam Vice President, thank you. Uh, Mr. Melendrez, can you, I don't know if I missed it somewhere or not, but did we or did we not approve the Housing Forward initiative? Mr. President, uh, Councilor Bassan, no. The, what's been dubbed the Housing Forward initiative is packaged in 02254. Um, that received two hearings at the LUPS committee. It's gonna be deferred tonight uh, if the vote goes accordingly to June 5th. So this council hasn't even heard it yet as a full body and certainly has not approved it. That's, that's what I recall too, so I just wanna circle back over to administration. I had the pleasure of going onto the City of Albuquerque website today and the big greeting, blaring thing in your face is the Housing Forward plan, but it sure does look like it's already done. And if you click on it, it opens up to other issues and, and other details that are in that plan. And it's not a question, Madam Vice President, but it's a comment that it does look very premature. And we haven't heard it, we haven't, talked about it, we haven't voted on it, and it, it seems like the administration has decided that this is something that has happened, and, and we haven't decided that yet. Thank you. Councillor Fenton. Yes, yeah, just to be clear, uh, the uh, sponsors uh, 
we've decided to put this off until after we're finished with the budget and we can have full attention span on on uh, this very important issue two two important uh, uh, bills one having to do with the housing but the other having to do with our annual zoning update which just for everyone's information doesn't mean that we're updating every year because there's something wrong with it to the contrary we're trying to do total quality quality management on it which is this is the way you do it you take a look at it every year you make corrections to it and hopefully year by year it'll be less and less counselors of brain damage for you in the future <laughs> I won't benefit from that but as it becomes less and less I think uh, we'll understand that things are working pretty well with the IDO and we do have to constantly be looking out for things that don't work because it's a new ordinance and it's a really good thing in that the old zoning system was really willy-nilly as to whether it was updated uh, it, it was randomly updated I would I would describe it that way so just wanted to put that point out there since we were on the subject thank you but absolutely we should have a very good clear website messaging Agreed. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Councillor Lewis. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, question for the, the for Chief Medina. Chief Medina, sir. Uh, thank you, Chief. As he's coming down, um, I just wondered if you if you'd just uh, um, talk about uh, Operation Sticky Fingers and and especially some of the data that you all gathered from uh, from that operation as it relates to city buses. Uh, the data, the data that would, that you all gathered, that your investigators gathered, and uh, relating to our our free bus program. Vice President Grout, uh, Councillor Lewis, uh, the Albuquerque Police Department conducted an operation last week, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, uh, in the area of uh, Uptown and on the West Side, and uh, this operation was to uh, identify individuals who were involved in uh, shoplifting complaints that we had gotten from both uh, areas of town. Uh, the operation conduct. Uh, consisted of them watching the individuals come into uh, the shopping districts and for them leaving them. And there was a number of individuals who were uh, seen either exiting or, or getting onto a city bus after uh, they had conducted their shoplifting. One of the interesting things that occurred during the operation and uh, one of the steps we've taken to go forward is the fact that uh, we've made some uh, ACS referrals uh, because some of the individuals that were involved in the shoplifting were simply shoplifting underwear and socks. And uh, it seems to be more of a homeless issue and them looking for resources than they were the hardened criminals that we were looking for. But we have further operations that are going to be conducted in the near future. And uh, we're hoping that by getting ACS out there that we're able to, uh, to get some of the resources and maybe cut down on some of that lower level shoplifting that's occurring. But there was some individual that did utilize public safety. And I'm not going to hide the fact we just took an armed robbery suspect into custody, robbed two banks in Albuquerque. Uh, he used two modes of transportation, a pedal bike, and he got on the city bus at one point with his pedal bike. No, thanks, Chief. I think your, your, your investigations show that the investigators were meticulous about studying uh, you know, how, uh, how the shoplifters got to and from those locations, and it found that there was one-third. One-third of the people that you arrested uh, were, uh, used a city bus, um, took advantage of the free bus program, got on that bus going to, uh, going to or from uh, where they thought, and as you mentioned, I mean, and by the way, great work. I mean, I, I think you know, our, our retailers are desperately uh, you're looking for the city to help them right now. Uh, businesses that are just desperate about people that are just overrunning their their stores and and uh, and stealing their stuff. And so, you found a pretty good amount of stolen items. Rest a lot of people. A lot of people were uh, uh, found to be trading um, those items items for drugs. And so they're getting on those buses with fentanyl and um, uh, it was a pretty heavy drug use. Um, and so, um, are, are you are you giving that information to the transit um, uh, to the to the transit department? Are you giving it to uh, the transit uh, safety you know officers that are there? Are you sharing that information? And and, and by the way, I mean, is this? Uh, I know the journal got a hold of that. Um, uh, how are you? Uh, um, I guess sharing the statistics and the data uh, from that operation. President Davis, uh, Councillor Lewis, the Albuquerque Police Department did a press conference on this. Uh, we released all that information at that time, and uh, the media wrote uh, the stories as they saw fit with the information that was provided. Uh, we are sharing this information with other city entities, and we are looking for solutions. Uh, one of the things that we're proposing that we need to check into the legality of is to see if the fact that if it's possible for us to issue criminal trespass notifications for individuals who have been taken into custody for committing crimes. So uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Uh, I know the process may not be perfect, 
uh, but we will continue to work our operations and try to offer solutions also that our governing bodies can make decisions or so that our, our uh, directors and other departments can make decisions. No, thank you, Chief. And then a question for the uh, transit director just related to the, the study that's, uh, that they're currently, currently performing regarding the, the free the pilot program. Transit director not here. I guess I'd direct this to uh, Mr. Rael. Um, thank you, Director. And this this study or this data was, I mean, it's it's uh, it's added to some other uh, data that we got this last year, and and the journal actually did a pretty good job describing the the last year regarding you know safety on the buses. Reminded us that uh, last summer that former uh, New Mexico Attorney General Hector Barderas he actually warned us. So he warned Albuquerque City Councilors. Uh, that shoplifters were using uh, the city's free buses as getaway vehicles. Um, he, I mean, the attorney general said that he believed the free fares pilot program was attracting uh, brazen shoplifters who were walking out of stores with power tools, electronics, expensive kitchen appliances, and just you know hopping on free buses to escape. You know, we we um, somehow forgot that he said this over in the discussions over the last year, or, or uh, said maybe he didn't really say that, but he actually did say that. Uh, because of investigations that, that they did. Um, and then we have this uh, you know, Operation Sticky Fingers that APD did that really proved it to be true, uh, that in fact uh, there are people that are using our free bus fare program, taking advantage um, of the city buses um, to get to and from places where they're, uh, they're committing crimes, um, you know, retail crimes. Um, and then... Uh, uh, you know, you know, on top of that, we have uh, specifically bus drivers who said that they quit uh, because of the, the, the free pilot program and saying that they felt like that that program was contributing uh, to crime on the buses and, uh, and certainly to their quality of their job, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, they quit. And so I guess my question to you is that we, we have the analysis coming up. I mean, we're still working on the... Uh, the analysis of the full pilot program, and then your department is going to come back with recommendations about um, how to proceed. Council, you know, we made it to where we can't make any decisions regarding this, but we've also given you a 44% increase to uh, the department that we're going to vote on tonight. So 44% increase in funding uh, to the transit department. There's $3 million to fund the free, free pilot program, um, and yet, uh, uh, you know, Ridership is down. Uh, heard a lot of talk, and I'm talking about my my constituents and people saying that the uh, the buses are dirty. They're observing drug use on the buses. They don't feel safe on the buses. And so, um, I guess my question to you is: um, in this analysis, um, do you intend for that analysis to include uh, how shoplifters are abusing free fares and how the the pilot program? is contributing to causing drivers to quit. Uh, Councilor Davis and Councilor Lewis, uh, that's a lot right there. Um, we are working through the analysis. Um, you know, it will be a very thorough analysis of the zero fare pilot program that, that we will be um, discussing. And we do have a technical team that is, as Council has set up, um, involved in those discussions that they've been meeting on a weekly basis. Um, you know, I will state that, that if you look around the country, this is a societal issue. It is not just the zero fares that we're seeing that are having an impact here. Um, there are places like LA Metro, there's, there's places, um, you know, across the country, Denver's one of them as well, that, that do charge a fare and see all these same issues that we are currently seeing within our transit department as well. So we will be addressing that. Um, I, that's why I think um, a lot of what we had discussed with the safety and the security is the biggest piece of it. Um, and really trying to, I think, um, as far as what Chief Medina did and his team last week with this you know, operation to really get um, eyes on the buses, eyes on not only the buses, but um, the other means in which that these people were also getting away and, and using you know, what other, whether it be bikes or vehicles that they had um, on foot. Um, all that comes into play, and I mean, that was one-third that you were finding that were on the bus. That's also two-thirds that weren't using the bus to, to be able to do these things. 
Um, and as he said, the, the ACS intervention I think is key too. But I think we have a bigger issue here, and it is a societal issue that we're seeing these things happen. Good, director, I, thank you. you know, we've had a lot, a lot, of, lot of chances to talk about mm -hmm. this, and so, but I only have a little bit of time to ask you some questions. So, um, have you have you received those uh, that data? And by the way, um, that's great. Two thirds of the people weren't using the bus, but one third were. Uh, a third of the people were were uh, using our free pilot program to and from places that they were stealing things, you know? So, and again, if this is not the cause of all the problems in our bus system, but it's one of the causes, I think you have to, and I, I'm, I'm having a hard time even convincing everybody to look at the actual data, the evidence that's right in front of you, and just admit that this pilot program has caused some issues, some challenges, whether it be with drivers, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, that are quitting because of it, and what they've seen, uh, the data that we got from the inspector, or the, the attorney general, um, APDs. So I guess my question is, have you received that? Uh, I mean, you know, I would assume that you really want to get that data, you know, from that, from Operation Sticky Fingers and, and really how are you using that data? I mean, have you received that data and how are you using that? Councillor Davis and Councillor Lewis, yes, we're, we haven't gotten that data directly other than what's been released in the media. Um, you know, we are on a weekly basis talking with APD on our calls that we have with security where we talk about a lot of these issues that are going on um, and making sure that, that, you know, we know what's going on in certain area commands and that we can actively, you know, address those issues and be dialed in with APD, with security, with ACS so that we're handling those issues as they come up. Um, yes, we are looking at the data, um, you know, that, that is it. But again, it is, even before we had zero fares, it was a dollar. Um, you know, there's a lot of drivers that for a dollar are not going to start an escalation, you know, to collect those fares. Um, so they'll just let people on anyways, you know, well, the so difference we have is those we issues know who still. They are. I mean, I think the, the, the suggestion over the last year um, was at least to be able to know who people are, at least have a name, which I think was pretty reasonable. But um, if the data and the evidence that's right before us uh, is not at least allowing us to at least consider the fact that maybe our thinking on that should change a little bit as well. You know, maybe we should look at uh, this pilot program. So, I, I mean, I would expect that that evidence, that data, that evidence that's right before us would at the very least uh, be in this analysis that's coming here pretty soon. And so, um, you know, I hope to see it in there and I hope to see a really good solid analysis of how, uh, again, from the Attorney General, from our own department, about how this program and um, is is contributing to, specifically contributing to you know theft and crime in our city. Again, Councilor Davis, Councilor Lewis, I think that you will see that in this um, in this analysis that we do. We do have a very thorough analysis in which we are looking at multiple agencies across the country and the things that they are being faced with as well. Um, so you will see that in this report. Thank you, Councilor Lewis. I can tell you um, that I was just in LA this weekend. And I had to catch a bus to go from point A to point B. There were two different buses that came by me. One was their city bus, and one was the bus that I needed to get on. But I specifically looked in that bus. I got in there, and I looked at it. It was so clean, and it didn't smell. And there were people riding the bus as intended, and there was no security guard. And it was a breath of fresh air. And I wish that our bus system looked like that bus system. And that was a big city. Um, that was just my observation. Uh, thank you. Um, Councillor Benton. Thank you, Madam Vice President. Uh, I'd like to hear what you were uh, about to say before you were rudely interrupted uh, with regard to neighboring cities and what they're experiencing and what's going on nationwide. I think we have a professional transit manager here in front of us. It doesn't need to be cut off in that manner. And I would like to hear Madam uh, Vice President what uh, she was about to say about the lay of the land nationally. This is not just here. You can go certainly and find a clean bus in various places at various times. But what I'm talking about is you know how we operate the systems and the societal challenges of operating these systems. So uh, you were about to say something, I'd just like to hear it. Uh, thank you, Councillor Davis and Council ben Councillor Benton. I do, I really appreciate that because again, like I said, it, it is an issue. It's not just Albuquerque that's being faced with that. It, it is a, a, not only just a, a national issue in the U.S., we're finding that you know across the country too from what we're hearing from some of our um, 
consultants that we have as well um, that are discussing this. And it's not the fair, um, you know, all the agencies are seeing these issues when it comes to security and safety. You're seeing a lot of agencies really ramp up and spend a lot of money on security and safety. Um, you know, we are doing that as well. We're trying to make maneuvers here too, just to, um, you know, with the, uh, uh, the positions, unfilled positions moving to APD, with some of the stuff that we're doing with our security planning and our passenger removal process, which I think is, is key. But we're continuing to evolve and it, it's just challenging right now. Uh, we're not the only city that is experiencing driver shortages. Um, I believe at the last councilor meeting, I just started you know, looking through a lot of these, um, the articles that have been coming out since April about transit systems that are having to continue to reduce service because they're having issues with recruiting and retaining drivers and mechanics too. And we've talked about that as well. And I think for the first time last week, I actually saw that in a news article. I think it was SEPTA that had, had released that and was talking about that. And it's some of the major um, transit agencies that are out there. So, um, you know, again, it is a societal issue. I don't think that zero fares is entirely, you know, to blame. I do believe that it probably does put a little bit level of difficulty out there. But again, we are seeing these same issues and many agencies that are also charging a fare. And, um, you know, with regard to maintenance, with regard to all of that, right? Um, are we, how shorthanded are we in terms of just maintaining the buses on a daily basis and keeping them clean? Uh, thank you, Councilor Davis and Councilor Benton. Um, the department as a whole is about a 36% vacancy rate. Um, our Sunban chauffeurs, our MCOs are right in that range between 35 to 36%. Um, we're continuing to have issues with, with bringing them on. A lot of the new drivers that we've had that have left have specified the hours and that just being difficult for them to manage um, you know, with, with family and, and those kinds of things. Um, on our maintenance side, it's even worse as far as our, our vacancy rates are. So in, in some areas, our vehicle servicers, as I mentioned, I think at the last um, COW meeting, we were in the 70% there. And, you know, and that's why we've done some of these things with the detailers and the contractors and bringing those on to try and help to um, you know, make the buses cleaner and to put on some daily refreshes that, that we have as well. Um, because again, I can't agree with you more. It's extremely important that we have a safe, secure, reliable, and clean transit system here for that people can use it. And, and Madam Chair, um, yeah, with regard to uh, that, um, because I know that's a sensitive matter, and I, I'm, I'm a supporter of our union labor in Albuquerque, uh, but I think we have to understand that we're all in this together, and, and I see my friends in the audience uh, from labor, and um, we've gotta have all hands on deck to help us hire um, across the board in the city. Uh, this is a crisis in the city, and again, in other cities, hello, yeah, all over the country, there are problems with city government that we could throw stones at this one or that one, but they are fundamental issues with regard to local government. So uh, I really appreciate, you know, that you're trying. I think we need to try harder. I hope my friends in labor will help recruit brothers mm -hmm. and sisters in labor. Uh, for these departments because uh, we're in a world of hurt right now in terms of delivering services. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councilor. And, oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Um, I, so not to, not to bogart the uh, discussion, but I was hoping to speak to Chief Medina when I first asked to speak. Well, Madam Chair, point of order. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, Chief Medina, as we, I had asked, uh, that was, I believe, you'll confirm that I asked during his yes. uh, time on the, on the Stand, no so. problem. Just point of order to say a few words. Councilor um, Lewis. Thank you. Um, you know, we cut people off at two minutes with a buzzer, and we don't call it rude. Um, but we have a certain amount of time during Q&A, you know, to ask some questions. And so um, any other counselor wants to ask some questions and some follow-up, as you just did, Councilor Bitten, I mean, you're welcome to. That's what um, I did. But I wouldn't call that rude, just like I, I would I'd, say that I'd say it's rude when buzzing people off somebody. in two minutes is not rude either. Person in mid-sentence trying to thank respond you. to thank your you. question, sir. Thank you for giving okay. her the right. time. Thank you. May, thank I, you may I get the floor as I asked for previously with the chief? Thank you. Chief All right. Thank you very much. Um, let's see. Councillor Benton, let's move on. Yeah, I have a question for Chief Medina, as I did President when he was up there before. Benton. Thank you, sir. Good to see you again. Um, my question is this, with regard to transit and security and police, what's to prevent you from putting a couple of bike cops on the ART buses and on the 
Central Avenue buses and on the San Mateo buses and let them hit, hit the street. I'm not saying on some rigid schedule where everybody knows what they're doing, but rather to uh, get them out there visible on our transit system and they're mobile because they've got their bikes. What's to prevent us from doing that? Uh, President uh, Davis, Councillor Benton, absolutely nothing. That's actually a direction we're going to be looking at going is getting more officers uh, on the bus when they have more free time. This comes down to resources. I've been in this council when they asked me to increase traffic tickets. I've been in this council when they asked me to increase homicide clearance rates. At a certain point in time, I run out of officers. And uh, we've tried to meet the needs of uh, everybody. We know that. I understand this is a societal problem. And I mentioned the fact that we're going to rely on, on uh, ACS and the fact that some of these individuals needed resources. And there are st still some in the bus that need to go to jail. And uh, hopefully- Well, a lot of those people are on the bus. If I may, we, we don't need to belabor it. I was a simple question with regard to the utilization of bike officers on ART and on yep. uh, Albuquerque Road. As resources allow, we'll look at that in the future. I'd really like to see it in the near future because I think it could be super effective. And I'd like us to at least, you know, give a, get for us to receive a, you know, a short briefing on how, what it would look like if you were to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Benton. Um, Councillor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I had a question for uh, our transit director, please. That's, I was on the same path. Sorry to make you go back and forth and back and forth from your chair there, um, but um, I know we have issues with crime on the bus. Um, no, but my biggest concern has been what it's always been, and my concern is for the safety of the bus drivers, the safety of the citizens riding the bus, and making sure that the safety of the security officers are, are looked at. So when we talk about um, these analysis, I just want to make sure that we have um, safety issues in place for the bus drivers because these bus drivers are probably exposed to fentanyl every single day of the week. And I want to make sure that the bus drivers are not in a situation where they're worried about reporting these kinds of issues. And if that means that takes that bus offline to be mitigated, then we need to make sure that we do that because I know for a fact I have pictures of individuals using fentanyl in the bus. And so we need to make sure that, that their safety is, 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 is taken care of, the safety of the security officers and also the citizens that ride the bus. I want to make sure that uh, if there is some sort of fentanyl exposure that we make sure that the, that bus is rendered safe. We also have another issue. If that bus has an exposure of fentanyl, then that bus is going to be taken offline. And we also need to make sure that we take care of the individuals at the main office who are handling that mitigation. I mean, we might need to have somebody show up to the bus, basically dressed in a bunny suit, take it all the way back and have somebody mitigate that bus in a bunny suit. So, I mean, those are, those are very, very, very big concerns. Um, so I want to make sure that uh, these individuals are very, very well protected. It's very important that you know we have issues um, trying to hire folks. Um, we know that the pay isn't the best for these folks. Uh, I know we're working on that as a council and, a, and as the administration, but what we need to do more than anything is to protect them. So I wanna make sure that you are doing something to make sure that all of these things that I just talked about are going to be addressed without any adverse um, reactions from, from the administration, that the rank and file worker can actually report it and not have any issues going forward with it. Councillor Davis and Councillor Sanchez, uh, I believe we discussed this last week and my answer hasn't changed. I, I fully encourage people to report any of, that is any of those issues that you mentioned that are affecting the safety and security of either the driver um, or, or any of the passengers that are on the bus, and there is no repercussions for that kind of behavior. In fact, it is encouraged, and it will continue to be encouraged. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure that we have some sort of policy in place that actually addresses it. So, I mean, if you can let me know. Another thing that came up right now, too, is um, 
is there any way that we can actually do some sort of a referral program? Uh, let's say, for example, a bus driver knows of a friend, a family member that wants to actually pull on. Do we have something in place uh, that we can actually make sure that that person is, gets maybe some sort of a referral finder fees or, or something like that to bring somebody else on? Uh, Councillor Davis and Council, Councillor Sanchez, yes, we do have an employee referral program that, that we have um, pushed out to our employees and we can continue to make sure that everyone is aware of that referral program and how to make sure that they report when they do refer someone so that they can get the benefits from that. Perfect. That would actually help. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions for Transit Director? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Councillor Fablecorn? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm going to make the chief come back. Um, I'm sorry for the musical chairs. Uh, oh, he came back down the front. He was ready. Um, so, like that kid that's um, always in trouble in the classroom. I wasn't going to um, talk about this, but I, I feel the need to. Um, Operation Sticky Fingers was in District 7. Um, I've been working with a lot of the retailers in Uptown for quite some time. Um, they are experiencing really high volumes of shoplifting. I think we all know that. Uh, it's a major concern. We have one boutique who um, has been broken into four times and she's only been open for a couple of weeks. Um, so we do have a serious problem in Uptown. Um, and I was really thankful that APD did Operation Sticky Fingers and really went in and, and tried to affect the, the number of people who are stealing from our re retailers in District 7. Um, and so I, I was disappointed that the focus was taken off of that because this is something that the retailers have been asking APD for and we finally got it and, and it worked really well and we have lots more people off the streets that were, um, you know, causing problems in our, in our area. So Chief, could you just give a little bit of information about like how many folks were involved in the sting, how many people were arrested, you know, the actual data from the operation that was meant to and did help uptown retailers. President uh, Davis, uh, Councillor Fubelcorn, I may be off on numbers a little bit because I just got notified about this like 10 minutes before five. Uh, we had about approximately 30 individuals arrested. Uh, the vast majority of them, to be truthful, have already been released. We know that's the biggest issue that we face is that we've talked about it. We have a revolving door in the criminal justice system. I wish that MDC had enough room to house everybody that needed to be arrested, but the honest truth is they don't. Uh, we've talked about this. The mayor has an initiative, MCI, and a lot of that initiative is based off the fact that we need enough resources to get people over the underlying cause of, of crime. The underlying cause, and I hate to get involved in all the discussions, but uh, it's not the mode of transportation, whatever it may be. The underlying cause is we have individuals uh, who are committing crimes uh, for a variety of reasons, and a lot of times it goes back to substance abuse, and we need to have the systems to get those people to the help they need. So the vast majority have been released. One of the things that we are looking at globally as a department is we did move our SHIELD unit over to the DA's office, uh, and in doing so, it's really had paid dividends for us, and I will tell you that uh, last Friday I got great news from D Commander Hartsock in the fact that uh, the individuals from the previous day, we were seeking detention in 50% of the felony arrests, which is huge if you understand the numbers. Uh, the DA's office was presently in the past asking for detention in 12% of cases that were eligible. So we're hoping that we could put more detention cases put together, but I'm telling you at a certain point, the courts are gonna run out of resources for the detention hearings. The DA is gonna run out of DAs to prosecute the detention hearings, and there isn't gonna be a bed to take the individuals who need substance abuse to too. So I think this is something where we all need to work together. We need to find some solutions and we need to see how we could move the underlying issues forward and uh, find what we need to, to conclude it. But we do intend to continue these operations. Uh, some days we have 12 people, some days we have 20 people, just depending on the resources we have. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Chief. I, you know, I just wanna, again, thank you from District 7 for doing this. We, we do have an issue, and I, I think all the retailers were really happy to have a you know, very um, obvious APD presence um, in the last couple of weeks, and it does seem to have helped. Um, we are in, in conversations around getting an ACS team into that area, working with APD more thoroughly on future stings, um, and so I just, you know, I wanted to thank you for that and also just let folks know that there is a plan for Uptown area and it's probably, um, 
you know, if, if you're one of the bad folks out there doing things, you should really be knowing that APD, ACS, um, the city of Albuquerque is looking at that area now. So thank you, Chief. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Thank you both. Councilor Pena? Thank you. And I don't know if this is for the chief or for, if I'm just going to do commentary here or if it's for the director. Just to say that, you know, just hearing all the conversation here this afternoon, I think this is what initially had triggered the conversation with Councilor Lewis. And, and I think um, it seems as the will of this council that we do support free fares, right? That was kind of the compromise. But I think the, count, the point Councilor Lewis was making is that we are hearing from different people, whether it be bus riders, whether it be um, transit drivers, whether it be um, APD, whether it was from the, um, from the uh, uh, transit director and, and that group of people saying that they're concerned about public sa um, safety on the bus and crime on the bus, right? And, I, and Councilor um, Lewis put forth a resolution and I, the fr frustration I see is that we, we really didn't do much and I know we have the analysis is coming out so I look forward I really look forward to that because whether we're talking about that this is happening in the nation or across the country or wherever it's happening this is Albuquerque New Mexico and we really I think can get a handle on this if we work together you know I just got a call from the um, sheriff's department and they were saying that they were concerned about the free fares because of the fact that they were using them to as, as a getaway you, you talk about a third of the people um, um, using the bus to actually um, to commit a crime. I mean, a third of the people on the bus, that's, that's pretty scary, right? So I just really want us to work together. Obviously, free fares is something that the will of this council supports, but really get together to figure out what we need to, uh, to do. And this is from the administration's part, too, because I know that some people kind of stepped back a little bit from, from their positions because the administration is supportive of free fares and, and not really wanting to, to, to do the passes, but we really have to come together. And I know that um, people that are committing these crimes, a lot of them are just real small um, crimes and getting on the bus, but they're feeding an addiction, right? And as, we're, as we look at, at the, the epidemic that we have in terms of the addiction, whether we catch them now, you're going to be catching them again later, right? Because we haven't really addressed kind of the, the, the root causes. So I, j I just want to say that I appreciate everyone's comments, but we're, we're Albuquerque. I think we can get together, and I think there's enough people around that we can really do what we need to do, whether that is a pass system or whether it is um, having um, people ride the bus, or the, the police officers on the bus. But we do need to protect our, our drivers. And as uh, Councilor Sanchez was saying, people using fentanyl on the bus, that's real. And I know we, we're talking about it, we're listening, but these drivers are the ones that are exposed to it, and we really just can't continue to um, ignore that. So um, thank you for allowing me to give commentary. <laughs> thank you, Councillor Pena. Councillor Benton? Thank you, Madam Vice President. Um, so I have a question for, uh, I guess, Mr. Rael. Um, what is the status, and please provide an update as to when the New Mexico Media Academy lease for the rail yards will be submitted to the City Council? Mr. President and Councilor Benton, uh, first and foremost, I had uh, indicated to you last week that I would get to you this weekend, and unfortunately, uh, I didn't get a chance to visit with you. But let me uh, indicate to you that the, um, the preliminary review by the City Attorney when we put together this um, memorandum of agreement between the city, the state, and CNM, uh, three public institutions, was that there wasn't, uh, that it really didn't need to come to the council for approval in that it was an MOU. However, I think after some conversation, um, it became uh, at least clear to me that if for no other reason, it should come to the council as it relates to the, the length of the agreement and the fact that it is using a city facility. So um, I will, uh, endeavor to try and get that uh, EC to the council at the, at the next council meeting. Um, it is a agreement that is funded uh, by primarily by the state and, and CNM to uh, repurpose the old boiler shop um, at the rail yards. And it's a project that um, I think will be a very transformative project for, for that uh, particular area of the city, but we'll get that to you uh, by the next council meeting. 
Thank you. I appreciate that, and, and uh, I appreciate the state and everyone uh, and, and uh, CNM and everyone involved and yourself uh, who uh, put this together. But uh, you know, a lot of talk about administration and council and who deserves an answer to what, when, and um, you know, this is something that that we know was already in in the. Uh, it, it's a standard. I mean, to me, it, it involves a lease and it involves city property, and that's the end of it. Thank you. Thank you both. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Madam Vice President. I have a question for the Environmental Health Director. Here. Thank you, Director. I appreciate your call today. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to make sure that we are doing and just to state it in public is that there was some exposures over at the Gateway Center in reference to the asbestos. asbestos. I appreciate the fact that you, caught, that you contacted me, you contacted my office, uh, but what I want to make sure is I want to make sure that everybody, um, public is understanding that, and because we do have workers there, public is understanding that there was more than just a few of us exposed. So can you go into some detail that you went into with me in reference to our conversation as to what's taking place in reference to the exposure, how you're dealing with it, and how you're handling it? Uh, yeah, um, uh, Mr. President, uh, Councilor Sanchez, yes, um, the, um, the, the issue at hand is the demolition that happened in May of 20, May 24th, 25th of 2022 you know, roughly about a year ago. And so that's essentially the focus of the workers that were um, working at that time during the demolition. You know, so we feel that the, uh, the exposure rates, if anybody potentially got exposed to any type of asbestos, would have been, you know, during the demolition. Um, the first tour that happened after the demolition was around June 2nd, so a week after that. You know, so at that point, you know, you know based on our understanding and based on our investigation, we feel that the, at that point the exposure was, you know, pretty pretty negligible, if any at all. And then after, you know, subsequently it got even less and less. But we are trying to contact, trying to gather all the information of the people that actually worked during those times, and then you know having um, trying to make sure that they understand that they there was a potential exposure, and explain to them what that really means. And so we're still at that phase right now of gathering those names. Thank you, Mr. Director. Also. Um, with that, you know, we have a lot of uh, contractors, individuals that were in and out of there. You're working with those folks as well, correct? Um, Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez, correct. And currently in that building, you've mitigated all of the exposure at this point? Uh, we've mitigated, uh, uh, Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez, we've mitigated, they've mitigated the areas that they're currently working in. And yes, that's correct. Okay, and, and is there other areas that you will be touching within this facility that may have exposure that we need to make sure that we address prior to the demolition? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Sanchez, uh, yes, the uh, General Service Department is quite aware that, you know, any, any demolition in that building that they have to notify us and then do the proper inspection and then we'll do the follow-up inspection thereafter. Thank you. Madam Chair, just one more thing. You also had indicated that there was going to be a, um, that there was also a violation by the city. Can you explain that as well? Um, yes, um, the, um, I, I, I got a chance to look at the final draft of the, of the investigation report from our department, from our asbestos program, and yeah, there, there, most likely there will be a couple of violations that will be issued probably towards the end of the week. Okay, can you explain to the citizens and this council how that works in reference to a violation that, that you address um, in, your, in your house, so to speak, and then have to ex actually pass the violation onto the city because the city's the one that made the violation? Can you explain how that all works so that just the general public and also the counselors can understand the dynamics. Correct. In the asbestos program, the 
primary thing that you have to do is notification of any commercial demolition. So in the area that we are talking about, you know, that wasn't done. So that would potentially be B1 violation. Thereafter, the contractor is required to do an inspection for asbestos and then notify us of the results. That also was not done based on the uh, final draft of the uh, investigation report. So that would potentially be a second violation, you know. Uh, and the way it is, you know, it's going to go under legal review prior to be prior to its issuance, and they'll determine essentially who the the party that uh, the violation will go to, because the regulations say it goes to either operator, owner, or contractor. So it just depends on how things were set up, but potentially it could go to all three or just one of them. Okay, thank you. I might have more questions later on as this progresses. Thank you, Director. Thank you, San uh, Councilor Sanchez. All right, I just have just a couple of questions. I'm sorry I didn't get those to you earlier. Mr. Rael, um, we've all seen the news reports about large number of migrants who have crossed the border at El Paso lately. Um, has the city of Albuquerque made any preparations to receive these people and offer services? And if so, what preparations have been made? Mr. President and Councillor Grout, um, I will ask uh, Ms. Melendres from the Office of Equity and Inclusion to come up and, and say a few words about their coordination effort on this matter. Good evening, Councillor Grout and Councillors. Yes, the city of Albuquerque has continued to receive migrants all along since 2019 and expected the volume to increase after the uh, end of Title 42. The volume over the weekend really was not very much higher than it has been. So over the weekend and Friday, we received about 40 people. And today we received 35. And these are people who were ticketed. Uh, they, in, by that I mean they have plane tickets in hand. And so they have been paroled by the United States government with authorization to travel to meet up with their sponsors usually elsewhere in the country where there's a immigration court. And um, these individuals have been dropped off directly at the Sunport and they're helped by a group of nonprofits there that help them to get to their gates, pass through TSA, get some snacks if they have a long wait. And then if there's any that fall through, like a flight canceled, then we would put them up in a hotel overnight and give them a meal so that they could get their flight the following day. And that's what we have prepared right now. If the volume increases unexpectedly, then we have plans with the Emergency Operations Center where we could scale that um, you know, to any level that becomes necessary. But right now it's very manageable with the nonprofit we have in place. Thank you, what is the nonprofit? It's called United Voices for Newcomer Rights. That's one of them. And then there are other volunteer organizations that have been helping with migrants all along in a volunteer capacity. And they, one of them calls themselves Asylum Seeker Welcome. Mm -hmm. And then FaithWorks is another, very and good. mostly faith-based. Thank you, thank Welcome. you very much for that information. I appreciate it. Any other questions, counselors? That's it. All right, let's move on to the journal. Um, I move approval of the May 1st journal. Is there a second? Okay. All righty, we have a first and a second. All those in favor, raise your hand and say yes. Yes. Opposed? Yes. It passes. Madam Councilor Pro Davis. Thank you. Madam Chair, uh, uh, Madam Vice President, thank you so much. Well done as always. Um, a reminder that uh, we have a lot of things to cover tonight. We have a full house, so we're going to see how quickly we can move through those. Before I do, I need to address a couple of items of decorum. Um, sir, over here in the corner with the camera, you and I have had this conversation every meeting you've been here. You've been warned several times. You know the rules. I'm telling you now, you have to sit down if you're going to be here and have your camera and you need to follow the direction of the police officers. And you have to follow the directions of the police officers there. Consider those directions from me that you're on two warnings. If you have a third, you will be removed from this meeting. Sir, I, your rules are if you're going to have your camera, you have to be seated and the camera has to be placed in the media well. You must be seated, and you may not stand there during the meeting. I'm not going to argue with you. Sir? Yes, because we have rules for persons with cameras. I'm not going to have a debate with you in public. You may either sit or you may remove yourself from the meeting.
Please have a seat. Have a seat. Thank you, sir. Thank you, counselors. We will move on to the remainder of our meeting. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Sir, I'm going to ask the officers and the security officers to enforce our rules and ask you to be removed from the meeting. Thank you to our security officers and our officers for, for working with us this evening. Counselors, we're back to our agenda. Are there any changes to the letter of introduction? Uh, I move that the rules be suspended for placing EC 289 on tonight's agenda for action. 289 is the mayor's appointment of Mr. Dennis Armillo to the Joint Air Quality Board. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, we need a vote uh, for the rule suspension. That requires two-thirds of our vote. All those in favor, please raise your hand until the clerk has counted the vote. Madam Clerk, that's unanimous, right? It's hard to see sometimes on the side. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, I move the rules to be suspended for the purpose of placing R-138 on tonight's agenda for, for, for action. It's establishing the city, of council, city Council president of their designee or their designee as the city representative on the Albuquerque Regional Economic Alliance Board of Directors. With several seconds, I heard Councilor Benton. Councilor Lewis. All those in favor, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes. Any opposed? That matter carries unanimously. Councilor Grout. Matt, uh, Mr. President, I move approval of the letter of introduction. We have a motion and a second for the letter of introduction. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand until the clerk can count the vote. That matter carries unanimously. Thank you. Reports of committees, Mr. Chair, Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee met on Monday, May 8th, and reports out the following items. In the matter of O80R126, R127, and R129, that they do pass. In the matter of O79, that it do pass as amended. I make a motion to accept the committee reports. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your hand, say yes. Any opposed? Seeing none, that carries unanimously. Councilor Basson, Madam Chair. Mr. President, in the matter of R122, I would like to report out that the Committee of the Whole met on May, Thursday, May 11th. R122 is a due pass as substituted and to be acted upon at the meeting at which it was reported. And in the matter of R123, that it be without recommendation as substituted, as amended, and be acted upon at the meeting at which it is reported, I make a motion to accept the committee reports. Motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. That matter carries unanimously. And any other deferrals or withdrawals? Seeing none, we are on to our consent agenda. Are there any changes to consent? Seeing no changes or uh, uh, withdrawals from the consent agenda, we want to thank everyone who's been appointed to a border commission. Uh, we appreciate your service and uh, hope that uh, you enjoy your service to our city. Count Madam Vice President. All those in favor say yes, raise your hand. That matter carries unanimously. Announcements, Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be an Albuquerque Bernalillo County Government Commission plus APS meeting on Thursday, May 25th at 5 p.m. at the Bernalillo County Building in Sanchez Commission Chambers at 415 Silver Avenue Southwest. There will be a hybrid meeting, so you can watch online or come in person. Councilors, any other announcements? Seeing none, we're going to move on to general public comment. Um, here's what I'm thinking tonight, folks. For those of you who follow along, 
Uh, we know we have a lot of people here tonight on a couple of our bills, and so if it pleases the council, I think we're going to try to get through public comment and then probably take our standard uh, dinner break. For those of you who are trying to plan a little bit, my apologies to staff who might be here after our break, uh, but then we'll get to bigger things uh, that will take a little time. But we want to acknowledge and, and uh, give the folks that are here time to come tell us what they want and go home and do other things if they need to. Uh, and for those of you who will stay, we'll get to you on those bills. Uh, so as a reminder, there are public comment ground rules. Uh, each participant has up to two minutes to present, though you need not use all of your time. You have to address your comments to the city councilors through the council president, um, and any disruptive comment will result in removal from the meeting. There is a two-minute time limit. Our staff will give you a little notice, and you'll see some lights there. Uh, you'll see that as we move forward, and if you're online, you'll have a timer on our Zoom. Mr. Cornelius will manage the time for our speakers and call them in order. If you are called and you are next up, come on down for at-bat. Take one of those seats in the front row. Uh, so that we can make time for you appropriately. Mr. Cornelius, please call our first speaker. Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Miguel Alvarez, followed by Matt Look. <laughs> Matt Look, followed by Gabriel Nadales. Exhibit, uh, is there an overhead? If you put it right there, we can see it. Yeah. Oh, there right you go. Uh, I want to hold you right here just a minute. We finished this zoning issue. Is that correct, Mr. Melendrez? Just remind me. Um, Mr. President, uh, we are aware of a zoning issue that may be being discussed today and that came in through emails involving a multi-unit apartment complex on the west side that is a pending application with the that is a pending application with the planning department and it wouldn't be appropriate for you to hear uh, uh, presentations on that tonight since it will be a closed record review in the event that it's appealed to this body so as you all can tell tonight we have a lot of rules and mr luck thank you for being here i need to make it clear um, there are a special set of rules for how the city council has to deal with zoning issues and that means that we can't discuss those in this meeting in public until it has come to us through the zoning hearing process and so counselors are not allowed to participate in those conversations until it comes to us. So if you want to speak on a zoning issue this evening that relates to a pending matter, we can't do that. And this looks really close to it. And I want to say if it mentions anything about any of those zoning rules. No, no, it's not about zoning. It's about uh, trash and trespassers. All right, let's try it. Let's try it and see how close we get to the line. I just sure, have sure. to be sure we pretend we don't disqualify all the city counselors I, I, and nobody I, gets stop, to say what Stop they want. me if I... Talk about something I shouldn't be. Great. Good evening, Councilor Davis, City Councilors. I'm Matthew Look here for Garrett Development. I'm here to talk to you about the illegal activities occurring near the Reordance uh, Sports Complex on the west side near 98th Street and Arroyo Vista, located in the 900 acre city open space in the escarpment and the adjacent land owned by Garrett Development. If you weren't aware of the problems, there's been numerous shootings, illegal dumping, hopeless encampments, and trespassing in the area. A few months ago, Councilor Sanchez inform me about this problem and with his help and the assistance of APD I'm happy to report that we have installed New Jersey barriers and security cable barriers and locks at that location. It has greatly reduced the illegal activity in the area. I'd like to thank Councillor Sanchez for his leadership and APD for their help for enforce, enhanced enforcements in that area uh, to deter these activities. And while there has been an, a drop in this illegal activity, I'd like to report these violators are very aggressive. Every week they cut all our locks, all our chains, remove all our barriers, take all our fences. And so I'd like to tell the city to keep up the vigilance, keep the enhanced enforcement in the area. Um, I also like to talk about the illegal dumping in the area as well. That's also happening throughout the city. Every year we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in addition to other homeowners and landowners to clean up tons of trash illegally dumped on their property that is not their own um, and forced to pay thousands of dollars to the city to dispose of other people's trash at city landfills. Um, to help victims of illegal dumping, I'm uh, suggesting that city council consider either waiving or providing vouchers to the city dump for dump fees to dump other people's trash that are dumped on our property. Uh, providing waivers and vouchers would greatly help landowners and, and help with the expensive cost of cleaning up, um, and hopefully that will help keep the city clean. Thank you for your support. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Luck, for coming up here. We had this discussion 
And I really like your idea. I think, I think we have something there. Um, definitely, I'm going to talk to some of the other counselors and also to the administration and see if there's something that we can come up with in reference to that. Because I've had many complaints where, and I think all of us have had, is where we actually make sure that we're trying to clean the properties, send somebody out there from code enforcement, and the same person who's making this effort to clean and spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to clean their property is then getting fined on top of cleaning. So we need to find a way to uh, clean up the trash, uh, but also make sure that you don't get the, the double charge that, that I know you're receiving. And I know that there's other people that are in that same boat. Um, I've seen it. I've seen people in apartment complexes just throw their stuff over the backyard um, because it's just the mesa out there. But that mesa is actually somebody's property. And that, that somebody has to either clean it or face a fine. And, either, and both of those things cost money. So I understand where you're coming from. So I will be definitely looking into that. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Gabriel Nadales, followed by Diego Lopez. Members of the council, and my name is Gabriel Nadales. I am the national director of Our America, an organization dedicated to, co to promoting common sense values like freedom and equal opportunity. First off, let me just say how shameful it is the, the crime rate has gotten bat so bad here in Albuquerque. Before coming here, I was talking to one resident, and she told me that the police doesn't even have the manpower to respond to calls. She had to wait in the cold for over two hours just so the police wouldn't show up. But the police isn't the problem. The police officers that I've spoken to and obviously the police chief here, they're trying their best to, to lower the crime rate. But how does Albuquerque have one of the highest murder rates in the country? I mean, the murder rate in your city is more than three times the national average, and it's even higher than in cities like Los Angeles, New York, and San Francisco. And to top it off, 50% of your homicide victims in 2022 were of Hispanic origin. I'll tell you, the problem is that the policies of New Mexico release repeat and violent offenders on the streets. In 2019, for example, your jail records showed that on a given weekday, the police arrested 70 to 90 people, the majority of whom had warrants. Last week, myself and uh, several others wrote to you a letter, and for every single one of you counselors, as well as Mayor uh, Keller, asking you to fight to protect your residents at the, the, the state legislature, but I felt compelled to follow up on that letter and come here today because something needs to be done and your residents can't wait any longer. Just today, four people were left dead and two police officers were injured in Farmington, while well, yesterday there was a shooter in Wyoming and Central. It's about time we strengthened penalties for repeat and violent offenders if you don't want your businesses to leave, as well as some of your more uh, privileged residents, you have to do something about this crime rate because otherwise you'll just leave the most vulnerable and low income, like black and Hispanic residents, uh, to, the, to the clutches of crime. Thank you. Diego Lopez, followed by Nikki Dixon Ewing. Nikki Dixon Ewing, followed by Twyla Courtney. Twyla Courtney, followed by Carlos Benavides. Carlos Benavides, followed by Safa Abid. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Safa Abid. I'm a housing coordinator at Lutheran Family Service Refugee and Asylum Program. So actually, um, uh, we are receive a lot of uh, cases coming from outside United States as a refugee. So our problem with that is the housing, because everybody now is a housing is really demand now. So for example, family of four, we receive money from a federal government around $4,000. So we spend this amount of money for housing within first month, even before they arrived. So I'm here to ask if we can, the city of Albuquerque help us with this issue. For example, if we can give us 
the, our clients priority for uh, housing, public housing, or for Section 8 program. Additionally, maybe we can establish uh, something to help us, give us like six or 10 or whatever uh, how public housing so we can give it to our clients when they arrive as a temporary house. Thank you. Sir, if you would, um, if you're doing that work, I think Mr. Real can help you connect. I just was looking for the director. Yeah, so you just spoke a minute ago, but there's a director who helps us work on our immigrant services, including <coughs> those services, and I'm sure they can help okay. connect you with them today. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Safa Abid, followed by Sharon Alexander. Sharon Alexander, followed by Augustine Romero. Good evening, council members and audience. My name is Sharon Alexander, and I'm a member of Women Taking Back Their Neighborhood. I am 100% <coughs> for a city manager. We need change. I looked up the definition of a city manager, budgeting, overseeing staff, and city planning with citizens and council. And if we and if the city manager isn't doing his job, he can be fired. We can't do that with the mayor. Reasons why we want a city manager. The homicide rate is 106 in 2020, 115 in 2022. It will be higher in 2023. In order to stay in business, people have to hire their own security. Yet Mayor Keller in this year's budget is recommending reduced funding to, for the police department. Did we hear a word from Chief Medina? No. We have had the fiasco with Coronado Park. It took the city months to have the homeless removed. In the meantime, people and businesses had to suffer and put up with the crime, the drugs, and filth. I have been told by a dispatcher at 242 Cops that if we try and evict people from our park, that we need to talk to the mayor because he has given them orders to stand down and not evict people of staying overnight stays in our park because they were told that they have no place to go. We have also seen the East Gate headline. City of Bestos Blunder. Oh, I guess I'm done. Thank you very much. Augustine Romero, followed by Chris Davis. Good afternoon, members, uh, council members. My name is Augustine Romero. I'm the uh, Ask Me 3022 M Series president. I'm here uh, to kind of bring some attention to our pay issues. Uh, our inflation is going up, and sometimes a 2% pay raise doesn't really allow you any liberty. Uh, more importantly, the morale has dropped among our employees because there was a, a pay equity lawsuit that was settled, and some people benefited from that where, where others weren't. And uh, we have scenarios where you could be a supervisor, and the person you supervise are actually making more money than you. I think uh, a modest pay increase could kind of put a Band-Aid on a problem that we could maybe address uh, at a later point. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Chris Davis, followed by Tad Niminski. Hello, councilmen and women. It's a privilege to be here with you. Each of you have tried to come on our buses. I'm an MCO at Transit. I'm a steward with 624. Ask me. And this is what's going on. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez, because you've identified a lot of the problems. Councilor Pena, you've come on our buses, and again, thank you. And you've also, Councilwoman, have said straightforward how the buses need to be cleaned. We're actually having drivers now because we don't have enough buses that are actually staying and not using their vacation to do what you're asking, because that's a legitimate ask. 
And you, Councillor Lewis, thank you too for coming on the buses and driving with us. But right now, we're going to have to be competitive and somehow retain these men and women. It always comes down to the money. But I'm going to veer just a hair off that because you guys are going to hear that all night. What we're looking at is safety and health. But at the same time, how do we inform? How do we educate our public? How do we get our employees motivated? And again, it's true, it's always gonna be about the pay. But you see this gray hair? 55% of us are gray hairs. I'm surprised you're not driving out there with us, you know, because we need you, you know? And I see you walking in Barelas. I, I, saw, I see you on the Tingley Pass, and I wave at you. I miss you at the old Casa Grande, serving you. You know, all of you here have a history. All of you have an opportunity to do the solution. I love the banter that both of you had, because that's solution-based. We're going to make it through this, and we're all going to stick to this. I heard the 44% increase to my department. But this needs to be throughout the city for all of blue transit. Thank you. Tad Nemiski, followed by Casey Padilla. Thank you. My name is Ted Nemiski. Viva marijuana. On the about every corner, like in Chicago on the 60s bars. Well, that's helping crime? Solve the crime? No. Yesterday, four people were shot in my, on my street, Central and Wisconsin. One fatal. These things have changed getting any better? No, it's not. Everywhere. Criminal put out of business, not only small businesses, but big giants, Walmart on Central and Zuni. How do you like it to see that? Isn't that big enough for you to understand that we do have problem right here? So anyway, lawyers, judges, bragmen, that same bragmen, such coward. Yes, coward. Yes, he protect criminals, cops. And helping help, who, well, now helping these lawyers up there. We have two ty type of lawyers, criminal defense lawyers and traffic <sighs> ambulance chasers, judges and lawyers making deals. I call it one, Metro Court judge and big time construction lawyers changing backwards date. So they can win the case because I filed default judgment. Thank you. Now time is up. Casey Padilla, followed by Laura Garner. Council President Davis and city councilors, my name is Casey Padilla. I'm the blue collar president for the city of Albuquerque blue collar workers, uh, motor coach operators, and sun van chauffeurs. I come today, we're not here to attack the administration in any way or their priorities of what they put in the budget, but we're here today to ask you for your help. The 2% that was in the mayor's budget falls short drastically as far as the cost of living and where we're at and what things are costing us nowadays. We're having many problems in many departments as far as retention and even bringing employees in the doors. You know, and also like was mentioned earlier with the with the penal lawsuit, that's put the employees in a tornado to where like the employees feel like they've been thrown to the wayside of just not knowing where they kind of fit in in this with their jobs currently with the city of Albuquerque. You know, one of the things that, that's coming up at the end of the year, and we're looking forward to that, is the class and comp study, right? I think a lot of us are hopefully not holding our breath too much for that, but I think we're eagerly waiting for that to see how that comes out for the employees because we're no longer really competitive anymore with any of the other surrounding uh, public employees right in the state of New Mexico. So, you know, we're hoping that, you know, you can help us build on this 2%, you know, get us somewhere closer to the cost of living. We know it might not be that amount of the cost of living, but, you know, even at the end of the year that we could readdress these things when this class and comp 
study comes out to kind of get us back to that competitiveness. You know, many of the employees have pride in what they do working for the city of Albuquerque. We provide a service that I think makes life's quality better in the city of Albuquerque. You know, from trash to water to free bus service and the things that we provide. And we just pray that we'd be looked at appropriately to that, you know. I know public safety looks, they look up to public safety a lot, and I understand that. I understand the job that they do, but I think we should be looked at equally as much as them, you know, when you guys are crafting your budget for us. Thank you. Mr. President. Folks, we know we got a lot of members here tonight, but we do have to follow our rules, and so we can be accommodating. Thank you for uh, following the rules, Councilor Bassat. Mr. President, uh, Mr. Padilla had mentioned that the class and comp study would be done at the end of this year, and I just want to clarify, it's supposed to be the end of 2024, or is it going to be the end of this year? Council President and uh, Councilor uh, Bassan, uh, we are finalizing the contract and the study will begin in the fall of this year. And Mr. President, and Mr. Batka, so it'll begin in the fall, but we anticipate it to take how long? Do we do we have an estimate? Because I thought I was under the impression that the long-awaited class and comp study, which I am eagerly looking forward to, is going to happen probably towards the end of 2024. Director Romero. Good evening, Councilor, Council President Davis, Councilor Bassan. So we are um, initiating those phases, and we should be completed with the study by November of this year. Well, that made my day. Thank you very much. Mr. Cornelius. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Laura Garner, followed by Stephanie Gomez. Hi. Good evening, Councillor Davis and the entire City Council. Thank you for having me here tonight. I am a resident of Albuquerque. I'm a small business owner, and I'm a realtor. And I understand the vote will be deferred into the Council meeting next month but I thought it was important for me to stand here today and let you know that I am in full support of the changes to the IDO. I think as a part of the Albuquerque Housing Forward Project, that's just one small piece that we can address our housing crisis here in Albuquerque. Um, we have realtors every day that have buyers ready to buy, but there, are, there is not affordable housing in our city. We have to address this now. It will only get worse if we do not do that. The other issue I'd like to bring up is I do live in the Onyate neighborhood. I do not know if anyone from my neighborhood association or the coalition of neighborhood associations have been before you prior to this, but I would like for you to know that if they have, they are not speaking on the behalf of the people in our neighborhoods. No one has consulted me, and I am positive that I have neighbors that are in full support of these changes, and I strongly urge you, if you have any questions, I can connect you with anyone in the realtor community that can show to you exactly how this will help our city to grow and thrive and be a healthy place and a safe place for all of its residents. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Stephanie Gomez, followed by Maya King. Hi, council members. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, just real quick background. My name is Stephanie Gomez. I'm clerical unit president for Ask Me Local 2962 a member of Council 18. I also represent Ask Me on APD's PPRB board for policy and review. I'm also a dispatcher for 911 communications. Um, I'm here asking, I've been a part with the city for 14 years now. I've seen a lot of us go through a lot of things, changes um, that have greatly affected my clerical union members from the COVID to cost of living, to short staffing, to the penal lawsuit. Groceries have increased, fuel has increased. Uh, just recently, our health insurance has increased. Um, all we're asking is for a fair pay raise to reflect this. Also, pay raises to help with staffing. Staffing is a huge issue out of several departments that I represent. I believe I have maybe two departments that are fully staffed out of over 15 departments. Um, I've, if they're not fully staffed, I have employees that are working out of classification or doing additional duties that are not described in their job description. Um, at 911 alone, um, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and today I was asked to come in to cover for staffing. Um, I've got graveyard employees being forced to work 16 hour shifts. Um, at minimum, I work three 16s a week, and that's not including all my days off or my union days that I'm supposed to be dedicating. If I'm not doing union hours, I'm working overtime to help with the staffing. Um, 
and then this is a normalcy, working 16 hour shifts. Um, I think, and just overall with the city, I think at 2%, it's just not enough. Um, I've got three of my lowest paying uh, salaries um, in three different departments are under $14. 2% is not even gonna get them to $14. You know, and, and like I said, with all the cost increases, it's, it's, it's not gonna see a difference to them. I can't ask them to pay union dues when they can't even afford to buy groceries. Thank you. Mr. President. Folks, we appreciate it. We're glad you're here to support your union and your members, but we do have to follow our rules, and that's to be sure that everybody gets a fair shake and uh, that we enforce our rules equally, so we appreciate it. But please help me enforce our rules so we can get to our legislation tonight. Uh, Councilor Pena. Mr. President, I just wanted to ask the young lady, um, you were going to describe the uh, departments or employees that were under $14, and then you didn't. So if you can... Oh, just real was... quick, just even with the transparency, transparency that was posted to the city website, um, I've got employees that are getting paid 1337, 1349, 1370. Those are the three that are under $14. Like I said, at 2%, it's not even going to get them to over 14 You know, And like I said, with the cost of insurance and cost of living increases, that's a three to four percent minimum that we would need. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you. Just questions for Mr. President. Question for the administration. So when I was asking if we had employees that were less than $15, I was told no. So who can answer this question? <laughs> Mr. Rapp. Mr. President and Councilor uh, Pena, let me have Mr. Uh, Romero uh, give you the information uh, as it relates to the pay of, of city employees. Director Romero, are you still here? Okay. Council President Davis, Councilors, um, we do have some positions throughout the city that are under that fourteen uh, under the fifteen dollars an hour. We're getting those numbers checked right now, so I could uh, report back um, a large number of those uh, positions fall under the temporary umbrellas of uh, employees, and we have three different temporary types of employees. Our regular temporary employees, our seasonal temporary employees, and our student temporary employees. Mr. And President, sorry, you said student? What did you say? Uh, we have three umbrellas of temporary employees, temporaries, yes. our regular temporary temporaries that are able to work up to two years our student temps, which need to be full-time students and show their transcripts. And then the third category are the seasonal temporary employees who can work up to nine months. Um, Mr. President, so outside of that, are there any additional employees that are making under $15 an hour? Yes, we do have some. And I'm getting that list run right now. Okay. Um, Mr. President, if they can come back and report on that. It's just really kind of concerning because I was very excited clear about my concern of people really not being able to make, you know, especially here at the city of Albuquerque, making under $15 an hour. So um, thank you, Mr. Romero. Absolutely. Uh, let's go to Councillor Bassan, then we'll go to Councillor Sanchez and others. Councillor Bassan. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Romero, don't go anywhere. I think you're going to be popular. Uh, I don't have a question for Mr. Romero, Mr. President. I just wanted to make sure to tell those people that are here and speaking on behalf of wanting more funding for their, for their well-earned uh, salaries that the committee substitute that passed the Committee of the Whole uh, meeting that we had last Thursday did incorporate an additional 1.5% cost of living increase for the city employees across the board. So although I, I know, I think everyone I've talked to, we agree it's not enough, um, but working with administration and figuring out what we could do, we were able to make it so that should the budget get passed tonight as, as it was substituted last week, for those of you out there, it's not just 2%, it will be, it should be 3.5% total. Councilor Sanchez. Thank you, Mr. President. I was actually gonna bring up the same exact thing that we did, we did pass that. <clears throat> one of the things I'd like to address as well is, is uh, one of the things that Mrs. Gomez stated, she's a dispatcher with APD. Um, she is dealing with people's lives every single day on the line. And so I just want to just say thank you for, for what you do. Um, I know for me, it has to do with everybody that touches the individual 
a citizen of Albuquerque. I know that each and every one of you does a job and, and has to go out there and deal with the public. When you see on the other side, you know, the administrators, they don't have to go out there and make contact with the public. Everybody here I know makes contact with the public. And you are our backbone. And I just hope that the administration is listening as well. Because without you, the services don't get de delivered, they don't get rendered, and they're not, and we, the citizens, don't get the services that we're paying for. So I just want to make sure that I, that you understand that I support each and every one of you. Um, may not be able to give you the money that I wish I could, but I want to let you know that I'm constantly fighting for each and every one of you. Um, I was a city employee for 26 years. I know what it's like to be an individual who has contact each and every day with the citizens of Albuquerque, and I know your professionalism. I see it every day. You know, when I would be out there as a police officer and I'd make contact with somebody from Parks and Rec, you know, we would have a good conversation. Same thing with anyone else, bus drivers and so on. And I just want to let everybody know that, that uh, I think not only me, but I think our council really supports each and every one of you and wants to see more people working in your capacity to deliver those well-needed services that we should be providing. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Councilor Grab. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, those temporary jobs, I just had a real quick question. Are those full-time or part-time jobs? Part-time jobs. Okay, thank you. Up next is Maya King, followed by Joel Via Real. Joel Via Real, followed by Christopher Ramirez on Zoom. Good evening, Mr. President, uh, members of the council. My name is Joel Villarreal. I'm a staff representative for AFSCME Council 18. I represent the employees here that you saw before you tonight here in this great city of Albuquerque. Um, I don't want to beleaguer the city council too much with, with our points. I think you've heard most of, the, most of our main issues here. I just really wanted to really emphasize with this council um, the difficulty that we're having right now with the penal lawsuit, right? I mean, it's, it's like the 800-pound gorilla, I think, that's dancing around here that no one's really addressed, right? I, and I will say it outright. The lawsuit did a lot of good for the city of Albuquerque. It fixed a lot of inequities that were clearly there. But there's also concerns because now what it's done is almost the opposite thing. We have situations in where a person, right, could or could not have gotten a raise, right, could be making more than their supervisor or that somebody that's at a higher level, level certification for no other reason than they had somebody of the opposite gender sitting in that position, right? Not within the department, but within that specific job title. And, and this is not theoretical. We literally have teaching assistants that are making more than head teachers now, right? This is something that we are hoping that we do get to work out, right? We know that there was $17 million that was allotted to that initially, another $17 million being allotted to this now, right? That's a significant amount of money when we're talking about raises within the city of Albuquerque. You know, um, as we're looking through this, we hope you stay focused on the fact that I, I think from what we've seen, there seems to be a very conservative view of what qualifies as merit here within the city of Albuquerque, right? We just want to emphasize those things are bread and butter issues here, our seniority, right? Somebody having more skill or more education or additional certifications than somebody else. These are things that should be valued within those positions. And we really do hope as we're working for a solution through this, that those are things that are also considered in there. So with that, I thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And we know that you all are working hard through this and uh, we hope to get through this all together. Thank you. We will transfer to Zoom, Christopher Ramirez, followed by Alex Applegate. I'm, am I, I'm waiting to be a panelist. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Christopher. Thank you. Um, uh, Council, Council President and Councilors, I'm Christopher Ramirez with Together for Brothers and the Albuquerque Bus Riders Union. 
Um, we are commenting tonight on the, the budget and reminding that the, the highest reported fares, um, the revenue raised at $1.5 million in 2018, represented only 2% of the department's budget. So continuing zero fares makes a lot of sense to actually have a more sustainable and consistent um, revenue for the city's transportation department. And then I just wanted to use a little bit more of my time to say the Albuquerque Bus Riders Union recognizes that the $3 increase that happened for motor coach operators this past year has meant that we have more consistent routes and not those ghost buses um, because we don't have enough bus drivers. And we would very much support increasing driver pay even to $20 or more an hour just to make sure that we have uh, drivers who feel like they're being compensated at the level that they should be. Um, and we can do that within the budget. So uh, again, we really support making sure that those motor coach operators, not only for ABQ ride, but also for Sunban, are compensated in ways that make sense for having a commercial driver's license and also for the, the way that they keep us safe on our buses and Sunban. Thank you. Alex Applegate, followed by Jane Beckley. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and Council. My name is Alex Applegate, and I have several things to discuss. First, I want to thank Councillor Benton for his years of service. You will be missed. Please expand Vision Zero funding. Please do not weaken cumulative impact regulations. I support Peggy Norton's AC 23-9 objections to the car wash on 4th Street. And finally, as the chair of the Transportation and Housing Working Group, I implore you to continue to support zero fares. The transportation sector is the largest contributor to climate change, and our reliance on automobiles is the root cause of this. Since the city is spending so much money on greening itself up, it makes sense that this spending should be extended to keeping fares zero and expanding the transit network. Cars are used by shoplifters and drivers commit other crimes, including killing pedestrians and cyclists. We had a hit, run, hit and run just a week ago near where I live and ride. We should make it more expensive for all auto users as a result. Bus riders and other non-auto users already subsidize automobiles with our taxes. They shouldn't be charged further for riding buses. The city should fully fund its transportation services, including raising wages for bus drivers and mechanics so that we can get our entire fleet on the road and expand it so more people use it instead of creating congestion and pollution in their cars. Many thanks and much love. Jane Beckley, followed by Barbara Blumenfeld. Mr. President and counselors, first, thank you for deferring consideration of the IDO annual review proposals to your next meeting. Second, the letter I sent yesterday to all counselors as an individual now has the endorsement of the SFVNA board. Approximately one year ago, counselors sitting here this evening voted to approve O2215, the narrow, and subsequently voted to override the mayor's veto. The language used to support the provisions of that ordinance spoke to the centrality of neighborhood associations in addressing social justice and community issues, promoting collaborative planning, ensuring democratic processes, engaging citizens in social change, and serving to ensure their representation. Less than six months later, O2254, a sweeping and consequential over uh, rewrite of major provisions in the IDO was introduced to council with no engagement by any neighborhood association prior to its introduction. It appears to me that the language of O2215 was a pretext to rewrite the requirements of recognized neighborhood associations and did not reflect the conviction of councilors about how to undertake city planning or engage in land use issues. It, if councilors you believe that my view is incorrect and accept the statement that engagement with neighborhood associations should be through the lens of promoting strong participation rather than appeasing requirements to take input while pursuing contrary objectives, I respectfully ask you to defeat O2254 when it comes before you. Housing forward initiatives can and should be considered in a process which actually looks like the principles of public engagement outlined in the narrow. Thank you very much. Barbara Blumenfeld, followed by Rachel Biggs. President Davis and counselors, my concern is also about the overall approach 
to the current homeless problem that the city is taking. The housing and homeless problem is critical, but this crisis is temporary. Yet the plans that the city is making make significant changes to the city and its neighborhoods that will be permanent, and I think they will be detrimental to Albuquerque. Moreover, because the problem is viewed as a crisis, the proposed solutions are being rushed forward without sufficient community input and without sufficient study of not only possible alternative solutions and ways to address root causes of homelessness, but also of the ramifications, both short and long term, that these proposals will have on the people of Albuquerque and on the people that they are supposed to help. I'm concerned that the city's quick fixes will, in the long run, do little to permanently solve the problem, and they have a high probability of making it worse. The proposed plan does more to enable the problem to grow and continue than it does to foster care, education, and treatment for those unhoused who, with such root cause problems addressed, might well become permanently self-sufficient. This is a current but a temporary crisis. We should treat it as such and not completely alter the character of Albuquerque with well-intentioned but not well-thought-out solutions. City funds, as well as citizen compassion, are not endless, and both should be used wisely. Thank you. Rachel Biggs, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. President and members of the City Council, my name is Rachel Biggs with Albuquerque Healthcare for the Homeless. We're here tonight to ask for your full support of funding the Transit Department budget for the continued success. My apologies, Rachel, I'll bring you back in. My mistake, Rachel. Um, please start over. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that, Rachel. Sorry. I'm back. Thank you. I'll be quick. At Healthcare for the Homeless, we are seeing an increase in the number of people that are transit dependent and living in poverty, and our transit dependent residents, seniors, families essential workers and people with disabilities deserve one less thing to worry about when getting around town. The previous process of supplying nonprofits with discounted passes costs nonprofits essential dollars and costs our clients valuable time and energy traveling all over town to secure a pass and get on with their important activities of going to work, school, or essential medical appointments. We are also concerned that the increased housing voucher funding that was passed last year has been changed to non-recurring. We've heard a lot about the housing and homelessness crisis tonight, and I'm here to tell you that the answer to homelessness, first and foremost, starts with housing. It, housing is the most powerful medicine we can prescribe as healthcare providers. It's the foundation for addressing health concerns, substance use, mental health, and we're really severely limited in our success and the success of our community if we cannot provide housing supports to ensure that everyone in our community thrives. We can solve homelessness, and the answer is housing. We ask for your reconsideration to move this life-saving budget item back to a recurring expense. Thank you very much for your time and attention in this matter and for all that you do and all the work you've put into the budget thus far. Rosemary Blanchard, followed by Robert Hill. Let's see. There I am. Um, Councilors and uh, pre President Davis and members of the council, I'm just going to speak very briefly. Of course, I only have two minutes anyhow, but I do want to, in regard to the budget, uh, support maintaining free fares for transit. It's very important to the people that I used to work with so much, which was people with disabilities that would have trouble with many of these hybrid systems where they would have to do a whole lot of paperwork in order to get free transit. Also, while you are deferring the IDO, and I'm glad you are to take time for it, I just want to say, while it's still before your mind, that the focus that, that uh, our city needs is to become a more vital place to live, work, learn, and recreate for all of us. If we don't make significant changes in how we provide housing and how we intersperse it with transportation, shopping, and the like to make a livable city, then we're going to be 
seeing Albuquerque lose the opportunity to keep its young people, to attract business, et cetera. The housing crisis is not a temporary crisis. Homelessness is just the tip of that iceberg. Underneath that are the families who are living in substandard housing that they are paying entirely too much of their income for. And the, the uh, uh, housing forward proposals in the IDO are designed to address this problem too. If we don't address it, as the prices of rentals are going up, as the prices of buying housing is going up, as the interest rate on buying a house is going up, we're going to see a real crash in the ability of our working people to continue to function well in this city if we don't give them some help and some support in affordable housing and attractive uh, service-rich service neighborhoods in which they may live. Thank you. Robert Hill, followed by Evelyn Rivera. Hello, thank you for your time. And I just wanted to let you know that I am in support as a mortgage loan originator on the front lines of the real estate industry, talking about the IDO changes as mentioned a few times already this evening. I know it's delayed, but I wanted to make sure that there were considerations for logic and data behind the decision-making process going into June and wanting to give extra resources for that so the Greater Albuquerque Association of Realtors, G as in golf, A as in alpha, A as in alpha, R as in Romeo, dot com, G-A-A-R dot com is a great location to find more data on housing and letting you know how and why we should be supporting the IDO zoning changes coming into June. That is the main point of my talk. And wanted to make sure that not just myself and the realtors out there, but a lot of the citizens in the community support this change. Evelyn Rivera, followed by Alexander Mujica. Uh, Mr. President and council members, the Housing Forward Initiative is rigged against single family homeowners. I am a realtor, a residential appraiser, and a senior homeowner. There is no proof that adding rental units to R1 home sites will provide affordable or low income housing. In fact, the beneficiaries of this initiative are the members of the commercial real estate industry who came up with this plan during an Urban Land Institute workshop. Single family homeowners were not included or notified in writing of this proposal. The proposal is based on false premises, such as stating that there is a history of racism and discrimination in our community. Another false premise is that there, that there will be 40,000 new jobs coming to our region. A national research organization states that there will be a net increase of 3,100 jobs in 2023 in Albuquerque. There is no proof that rezoning R1 properties will result in tripling the number of housing units. I found two studies that show the opposite. If this change to the zoning ordinance is made, single family homeowners will lose property rights and the character of our neighborhoods will change drastically. Members of the council with strong ties to the commercial real estate industry should recuse themselves from voting on this amendment. The single family housing component should be deleted from the O2254 initiative. Thank you so much. Alexander Mujica. Hello, there is an initiative pushed by private developers, uh, Consensus Planning and Jubilee Development LLC that is wanting to construct a 238 unit housing. Mr. Complex. Cornelius, I'm gonna interject here just a minute. Uh, Mr. Hika, I'm sorry, we're not allowed to speak about that tonight. I'm not sure if you heard us earlier, but this is about a pending zoning matter and we have an upcome, we have a hearing process for that. Uh, but unfortunately, the council is not able to hear about those matters tonight um, outside of that process. So if you have other comments, you're welcome to make them, but we're not allowed, gonna let you uh, make comments on a pending zoning matter until it comes to the council. Alrighty. Do you have any other topics you wanna to discuss with us this evening? No, I'm good. All right. I bet we'll see you in a few weeks or a few months when that gets here. Hang on.
Uh, I might add, uh, Mr. President, that there were several um, Zoom attendees that I could not find in Zoom. So that does conclude general public comment. Thank you, Mr. Cornelius. Uh, as promised, unless any counselor has any other plans, uh, I think what we'll do here is we'll take our normal 7 o'clock dinner break for about 30 minutes for those of you planning uh, to come back. I think we'll try to take those items that are, uh, we have a couple items to be deferred so that the handful of people here for those can, can exit if they so choose. Um, and then we'll try to get into the meaty stuff this evening, including uh, a really quick zoning finding and our budget. We'll see you soon.
All right, folks, we have most everybody back, so we'll get started with some easy stuff and, uh, until we get the rest of our teams here. I'm going to, just because Councillor Benton's not here, I'm going to pass on the zoning matter for just a minute. Uh, Councillors, Councillor Bassan, I think you are intending to defer two items, so if it's okay with you, why don't we take those, if that's okay? Mr. President, I would like to actually move the floor substitutes for those two bills, and it's my intention to be rapid about it but to truly pass the floor substitutes uh, 055 and 056 um, because I would really like us to be able to know which final version, which draft, which where we're at um, as far as the sponsor of the bill and the people that I've been working with. So I really hope to get your support on passing the floor substitute, but I have every intention of immediately moving for a deferral uh, till the next council meeting so that Counselors, administration, uh, both the IG, the IA, everybody can, AGO, can see where we're going and what we're doing. So with that, 055 is Committee Substitute 3, amending the City Inspector General Ordinance, Chapter 2, Article 17 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque. I move it to pass. Motion and a second. Mr. President, I'd like to move the floor substitute. I'll second it. Mr. President, I would really like to pass the floor substitute as mentioned above, so I urge your support. Councilors, any discussion on the floor substitute available in your iPads? See, no questions, we'll call the vote. All those in favor say yes on the floor sub, say yes, raise your hand until the clerk clears us off. Yes. And she nodded her head, we're good. Council Bassan as substituted. Mr. President, I would like to move deferral of 055 to June 5th as substituted. You have a second from Councilor Grout. Yeah. Councilors, any discussion on the deferral? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Any opposed? That matter carries unanimously. Mr. President, 056 is Committee Substitute 3, amending the Accountability and Government or or Ordinance, Chapter 2, Article 10 of the Revised Ordinances of Albuquerque. I move it to pass. Several seconds. Council Mr. Passant. President, I would like to move the floor substitute. All of the same reasons stated above, I urge your support. <laughs> well done. Councilors, any discussion? Seeing none, if the clerk's ready, all those in favor say yes. Mr. Matter. President, I would like to move deferral to June 5th as substituted. We have a motion in several seconds. Councilor Bassan, or Councilor Grouse, the one I heard. Councilors, any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the deferral till June 5th say yes. Raise your hand. Any opposed? That matter carries unanimously. Thank you, Councilor Bassan. We appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to go back now. We have Ms. Ronquillo here. I, I thought I saw Ms. Neff. Yep. Okay. Um, AC 23-9 um, is to return to the matter that we uh, sort of dealt with in a previous meeting. This is Ms. Peggy Norton on behalf of the North Valley Coalition who appealed a site plan administrative decision uh, approving a site plan. Uh, Ms. Ronquillo, uh, we had previously remanded this matter. Would you please uh, catch us up? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, at our last meeting, we held a full hearing on this appeal related to the placement of sidewalk elements at a car wash located on 4th Street. At our last meeting, the council voted to remand this site plan application to the planning department. Council staff drafted proposed remand instructions for the council to consider tonight. These instructions would direct the planning department to evaluate and make a written finding about whether um, this sidewalk layout satisfies the applicable criteria and guidelines, make an additional finding regarding the justification for where the landscape buffer is ultimately placed, and identify if there are any special circumstances that justify deviation from the preferred sidewalk layout, and uh, also ask planning to identify evidence in support of its findings and administrative decision, um, as that was something that was um, discussed at the last council meeting as lacking in the prior approval. Thank you. Councilors, uh, I'll make a motion to adopt the remand instructions as presented. Is there a second? Take a second from Councilor Grout. Councilors, any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to adopt, say yes, raise your hand. Any opposed? That matters unanimous. Uh, Councilors, I want to go back really quickly um, to 055. Um, we had one public speaker signed up on that matter. I know we uh, will defer it and be back, so I want to give Ms. Neff an opportunity if she's still here. Uh, she'd like you, to speak. Thank you, Mr. President. She's no longer in Zoom. Okay. At this, Thanks. At this time. Thank you. Good. Just to check our record. That's great. Thanks for catching up on us. Councilors, that puts us back. Uh, Councilor Benton, let's do this uh, nuisance substandard dwelling. That's next on our agenda. 
think we can do that one fairly quickly. That'll be R85 item C. <clears throat> and if the planning director and whomever needs to join can welcome to join. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, R85 is a nuisance substandard dwelling at uh, 3709 Lombardi Road, Northwest 87105, AKA 3711 Lombardi, Northwest 87105, uh, et cetera. Um, we've heard this several times. Um, and I guess we have an update from planning and um, we'll, we'll see where we stand with this. A uh, director will get, would you catch us up here? And then we have one public speaker and we'll, then we'll get to our decision. And uh, Council President Davis, City Councilors, it's my understanding that the owner has been doing her best to try to make some improvements to the property, at least to secure it. I didn't see it myself, but the report I received today from code enforcement was that they had attempted, the owner attempted to secure the property yet again on Friday, did some cleanup, but the property once again got broken into uh, right afterwards, and so the problem has not gone away. Uh, we had asked uh, last time at the deferral for the owner to please see what she could do to have it demolished uh, herself through a, co a private contractor. Uh, as of yet, we have not seen any contract in that regards. Uh, so I'm, I was hoping she was here this evening. Maybe she could enlighten us a bit more. Uh, this is one of those where I'm, I'm kind of on the, on the fence. If, uh, if she could line up a private contractor, it saves us from using our resources and then trying to recoup those resources. But I, I just don't know. So maybe the maybe the public speaker on this has some more information uh, than I have right now. Thank you, Director. Let's do this. Let's take Mr. Naminsky, who's our public speaker, and then I do see the homeowner or the representative is here as well. And so we'll kind of add her if it's okay with Councilor Benton, um, and see if we can come to a resolution here. But first, let's take Mr. Naminsky uh, on a public comment. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Dad Niemiski. Yes, I took a ride this afternoon up there, walk around, everything intact except in what caught my attention right here uh, reading that uh, after inspection, where is it? Mm, after inspection, mm, Investigated, the city investigated, has investigated the condition of said building, structure and promises. Well, structure, what can you, can you see it? Zero. Everything intact, except our border. Who, somebody opened one window, slightly. Window door, I don't remember. I wonder if that's what, City inspectors have come a card. So anyway, everything outside is nice and clean. Inside, you can tell. Roof looks, everything's intact too. There was no fire. And it's a junkie looks across the street, not on this property. This is simply two farm, farming houses. And now you want it again? That's what you've been doing and lying here, as I read it? It's uh, about condition? That's a bunch of lies. Every house after 30 years is going to be at risk when mortgage expire. That's what, exactly what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minsky. Councilor Benton, I see we have the homeowners here. Uh, she's not on public comment list, but she's certainly here for you. So we'll take your lead, sir. Yes, please. I'd like to, to uh, hear from her. And um, also, I, I know that there's been, she's had some conversations with uh, Nathan from my, my uh, office, and um, that he's also looked at the site and uh, took some photos that just recently. So uh, welcome and give us an update, uh, as I said. I can see that you've made some, some real efforts to uh, clean the place up. And I heard secondhand, which I, th I think I believe you stated previously, is that you would like to preserve the one house of the two. Yes. But can you explain um, where you stand as far as the work and then the uh, 
pro progress as far as demolishing the other house? Yes, so um, last time I was here, I think I do said, I don't know if 30 days was gonna be, but I appreciated the extension to work through this. Um, this property is a little bit like peeling back an onion. Um, I do want to create a community garden there. So the adobe home was my grandmother's home. And so this property and this building is about 90 years old. So that is the one that I would like to preserve. And right now what I'm having to do is just highest best use of my funds um, and really securing the property. Um, it has a history of the reason my father moved off that property is because there were several, several, several break-ins. So ultimately he had to just leave the property. We couldn't keep renters there. So now we're in this situation and I'm trying to basically revitalize the entire property. Um, so as I'm doing this, looking at this, there's also liens on the property from solid waste for the previous boardings. Um, so when I went to go look to, for um, permitting and, de and demolition, I'm gonna have to pay that too. So I was like, oh, okay, that's another fee. So I can't get the permit to demolish the property until I pay for those back things also. So my concern is like, if the city demolishes it, it's just gonna be another lien on the property <coughs> that is gonna stop the property from really being developed because I'm gonna have to pay all of those fees before I can do anything to that property. I can put any infrastructure, it's just gonna hinder and hinder the project overall. Um, so that's where I'm at. So I did talk um, to Solid Waste about the fees and how we could work through those fees. Um, did talk to James Perea, Perea at permitting and he explained to me that process. So I can pull permits by the end of this month to get the demolition going, but I'm gonna have to pay the fees and the liens that were been done over the past three years. Um, we have resecured the fencing, we've hung no trespassing signs, we've reboarded it. We do have someone going by about every day, if not every other day. Um, city code enforcement, we went on Friday, they were there this morning over the weekend, we resecured it. Um, so right now that's where it's at. It is a process, you know, um, the heads for the acequia and for the draining, each one of those heads alone is gonna be two to $4,000 for us to get this property back where it wants to be. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. We do want to de demolition those two apartment buildings. Um, but again, I'm having to make highest best use of my funds. My biggest concern right now with the property, honestly, is securing the property. Um, I've spoken with the neighbor next door and I think it goes hand in hand. There's a lot of homelessness there, right? Um, we can say that these empty buildings are bringing the homeless, and I am explaining to him saying, my family has had this property for 85 years, and it's when we lived here, there's a reason there were break-ins. There's drug use, there's the walkabout that goes right across the Asequia. There are other things, it's not just these properties. So we have to build up activity so that the homeless won't be there. But how do I get the activity there, put greenhouses there, really build a community garden, where we're gonna have homeless there and people coming in off the property. So we're just in this little kind of catch 22. I do think more activity and us being there more often will kind of help with that. Um, but do I spend the money on securing it? We had this conversation last time, securing it, getting the liens, putting up fence, putting up cameras, or do I spend the money in paying off the permits and tearing down the home? So I, I'm having to kind of analyze. And that's why I reached out to your office because I was like, okay, what do you feel is highest best use? Would you prefer for me to tear down those buildings or would you prefer for me to secure? Because we have encampments all the time on that property. And so I need to keep that property secure too. Um, so that's why I was you know, reaching out to the office and I had spoken with Nathan and explained to him like, you know, I have funds, but they're limited funds. Unfortunately, I had submitted for the grant, didn't get the grant, so that was very disappointing. Um, but we are submitting for other grants and looking for other resources and funds to develop this property. Councilor Benton. Mr. President, and, and look, I don't purport to make the decision for the city. I'm a city councilor, <laughs> and that's pretty low on the totem pole as yeah. far as who tells who to do what. But, uh, uh, you know, I, I see, you know, I mean, we can see that you're making an effort. It seems like, um, though, that that we're all kind of between a rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. We've got policies here that we've got to, that we have to enforce fairly across the board. Um, could I ask, it, it's a fairly large property. It, this, I mean, it's just, the, the nuisance it's a, it's is two described as two lots, but it's, it's bigger. It's two and a half acres. Okay. 
So it's not just the buildings. Right. There is a two acre lot mm -hmm. behind it. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of properties to secure, you yeah. know. And it's right up against the Ezequia. Right. Um, which is why I'm wanting to turn it back into a green area mm -hmm. and redevelop it so it can be the community garden so we could use those resources within the New Mexico Rio Grande okay. Valley. So, um, you know, to make it a green space again. And Mr. President, I just, you know, and in, in fairness to everyone, mm -hmm. yeah, people are gonna keep breaking into a building like this one, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's, did they break into both of them or did they break into the one you're trying to save? No, just as the other gentleman that just spoke, it was one board on the front west side. Um, and honestly, I don't know if we secured it and they went, I, I don't know, if they went back in, it was kind of half popped open and we had to pop it back mm -hmm. closed and secured. I don't know if they went in there in the morning. I don't, I don't know what that was. But even us, with my daughter and I, because we had talked, because it's all residential, even about putting either a tiny home or something on there. Um, so that's all things that's, you know, we have to consider where we're, we're spending our money to have someone there on the property. You know, the neighbors, they, they do say that they call the police and the police just don't respond. They said they had a couple in the backyard, which is on the two acre part. And that's, we can tear down the buildings. It's not gonna stop them from going on the property. <laughs> and putting up a tent and so I feel like our highest best uses, we have to find a way to secure the property overall. Summer is coming, you know, that's just. Yeah. I, I, I realize, Mr. President, that we discussed this with the planning director last time and you know, there's a, seemingly a disagreement, well, should they both be torn down? Mm -hmm. The planning director said something along the lines that it's not structurally sound. I don't purport to know anything about the structural. Sure integrity of, of the other building, but you know, you can, from the street, it looks more mm -hmm. like a savable building that, mm -hmm. that, that might still have some life left in it. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of at a loss to, mm -hmm. as to say yeah. how we should proceed. So for myself, I would- Oh ma'am, oh, hold on oh, a second. Let me, let me go to a couple other counselors here and we'll come back to you, right? Yes. <clears throat> so I, I will say it's been our practice normally, as Councilor Ben said, we sort of this is an ordinance we have to enforce fairly. It's been our practice to sort of give someone an extension if they're willing to show up and build a plan and give them time to execute it. And it has also generally been our practice of late, and it's up to this council um, to, if we haven't been able to secure the property and move forward sufficiently to pass this, these types of resolutions so that by the time it gets to the mayor's office and the mayor's signature and goes through that process and then starts to work through the planning process, there is additional time, but there's also a deadline for public safety purposes that says if you get there first, um, that's great. And if you can come up with something alternative with the planning department in the meantime, um, and they don't need to expend city money to solve that problem, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but it does keep this from coming back and back. And this council is about to go on break here, not before too long. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's some of those concerns as well. Um, so I just want to remind us like how we normally have handled these. It's hard to do, um, but anybody can make a motion at this point um, if there's other comments. Um, Councilor Ben. Could, could we hear from uh, the director and staff, anyone who wants to, to uh, get just up here? Let's I, hear I, from I, Director Varela briefly. It, if, if other councilors also have questions, please, they should go first. But I, I was going to ask the director, you know, is there any latitude with regard to the, this other house, the, the second building that's in somewhat better shape, as to securing that, fencing that, you know, doing a limited amount of fencing that could actually protect that structure along with boarding it up? I don't know. I'm just thinking aloud, I guess, about what could So happen. are you referring to just... I'm asking the director. Oh. Let me get the... Ms. Pinovich, give would, us just would that be, need to ask. If that would be an option, I'm asking okay. that. The, the position of the planning department and the code enforcement hasn't changed on that. The, the, we, we have not determined that, uh, you know, technically, I guess anything could be savable if you're willing to spend enough money. Um, I've seen some remodels where you end up keeping one wall of an entire, you know, house because maybe that one wall had decent footing on it. Uh, so, you know, with unlimited resources, which I'm not hearing is the case, uh, sure, things could be saved, but in a situation with limited resources, 
Um, and the ongoing uh, issues that are there that are not going to go away, the position of the planning department has not changed. Uh, it does take approximately seven to ten weeks after your resolution is passed for us to actually get a demolition crew out there. And so in this case, as with all others, we would say if you can come in and show us a renovation plan uh, with a signed contract and a demolition plan for the other stru structure, then the city is happy to uh, not use its resources on it. Just other one quick kind of detailed question, Mr. President. Uh, it, do we ever allow a slab to remain, you know, basically a concrete foundation to remain and remove the rest of the structure? It would seem that that would be less of a demolition cost than something that could probably be addressed at a later date. Do we ever and, do that? And, and Mr. President, Councilor Benton, no, uh, I'm not aware of that. Normally you scrape the property, uh, particularly if it's a 97-year-old adobe. I really doubt that it has a concrete slab in there. Probably. Usually those were dirt Yeah, I'm thinking of the other structure. Yeah, yeah. But g generally not. And, uh, and you've got your plumbing and everything which would run underneath that slab. So that usually is shot as well. So I really don't know that there's any efficacy, any, any savings in leaving a concrete slab uh, if you're going to be putting a plumbed uh, structure. Just looking at portability of removing of the uh, removal of the nuisance. Thank you. Councilor Jones. Um, thank you, Mr. President. This is a tough one, and it's, it's not easy for anyone. But I look at this, let's look at money involved. And this could sit another five years or more and still have nothing done to it and have all kinds of nuisance in the community because it's there. And the owner would probably have face more financial obligations because of the uh, problems in the community and also have to remove and scrape this facility. So um, I'm going to take a hard line here and say I think that we should enforce the uh, removal, the scraping of this particular property, particular structure, and make the property sellable, buildable, do something with it, uh, and not stress the neighborhood and the people around it during that time frame. It's going to have to come down. It's not reusable. Let's, uh, let's try to speed it up and make it more comfortable for the people who have to leer, leave, live near it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Pena. Um, thank you, Mr. President. So I, I'm hearing from the planning staff that she's working, trying to make some progress. Um, is that correct, Mr. Perella? You know, I just think it, it's, uh, here we go back to, you know, just creating the, the homeless issue here when we're talking about if you knock down both buildings, there's still going to be issues in terms of the homeless being on that property. And then I can see this lady coming back because she's going to be um, with more fines of trying to get... Um, um, trying to clean up the the homeless um, encampments on the on the property there. I'm real familiar with the area. It's one of uh, Councilor Sanchez's old area. I think it was yours also at one point before. Um, you know, there's not a lot of buildings around there that look real fabulous um, to begin with. So um, I, I I would just like to since she is working on it. Obviously, she's trying to come up with the resources, maybe doesn't have the ability to, to get the necessary capital to do it all at once, but sounds like she has um, been trying to make progress and is having um, some success. So I'd like to ask for a deferral to the last meeting in June. I don't know what that is. So the motion is the 21st, to the motion until June 21st. Is there a second? Councilor Benton has a second. Councilor, any discussion on the motion for deferral? Councilor Benton. If I could, just so we don't leave this hanging too much. Um, I would really uh, recommend maybe talk to our office again, and maybe we could get you with, with, um, with a design professional that could just look at it, perhaps, and have a, you know, another, uh, some sort of formal proposal to a counterproposal, if you will, to the, to the planning department, to the, the complete teardown. But I would also suggest that that proposal include um, uh, not only securing the remaining structure, if it's if it's deemed that, that if you get a second opinion that that might that might suggest that it could be saved, um, and then uh, and then to, to secure that with the fence, at least 
I can understand that a two and a half acre property in that area is going to be very, very hard to secure in its entirety with a fence. Mm -hmm. So, thank you. Thanks. Councilors, any other discussion on the motion for a deferral till June 21st? Seeing none, we'll take a motion on the motion for deferral. All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Is that what the clerk counts? Five. All those opposed? One, two, three. Councilor Sanchez, where were you? I'm sorry. I was You were a yes. So I have a six three, is that right, Madam Clerk? Yep. All those in favor of deferral say yes and hold your hand. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now we're back. Okay. All those opposed? That's six to three. So, Mr. Benavides, we'll see you back on the 21st. Please work with uh, the council staff and uh, the planning department to work through that. So we're losing votes every time. So, right, let's get that done. Thank you, councilors. Uh, next up, uh, Councilor Lewis, uh, R130, film. Ms. Schultz, is that you? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. R130. Uh, this is declaring a stay, uh, an interim stay of enforcement on certain temporary use restrictions in the Integrated Development Ordinance as they apply to film production, directing staff to propose an amendment to the Integrated de Development Ordinance to create a temporary use for film production. I move a due pass. Second. A motion and a second. Uh, Councilor Lewis, how do you want to proceed? I think, Mr. President, and uh, I guess we'll go to if there's any public speakers. or I don't have any speakers our, this evening. Okay. Um, then we'll have our, our staff. You want to give a kind of introduction to the bill and summary of it, and then counselors, if you have any questions, we can go from there. Sure thing. Uh, President Davis, Councilor Lewis, this is kind of a two-part bill that first and foremost issues a stay of enforcement on certain provisions related to the issuance of a temporary use permit. Um, the stay of enforcement is applicable to the Integrated Development Ordinance, so this is essentially telling the planning department to not enforce certain provisions of that document for a limited amount of time for a specific purpose. This is related to the temporary uh, use provisions as they would relate to film production. Um, right now, the IDO contemplates film uses on a kind of permanent basis associated with permanent structures, but it doesn't contemplate um, a, a kind of primary land use where film production would happen on a temporary basis. The city has been uh, approached by um, the film production industry and said that this is somewhere that our code is lacking. And so the stay of enforcement issues a uh, kind of immediate and, and quick response to that to say we're going to stay the enforcement of a couple of rules related to temporary uses. One is the time limit. Uh, the, a temporary use permit of this nature would typically have a time restriction of 45 days. Um, film production companies typically need a little bit longer than that, so that portion of the regulation would be stayed. Uh, additionally, the zone districts in which this type of temporary use permit would be allowed was, would also be stayed, and so would a few parking regulations related to the parking of heavy or large trucks um, that often film production companies need to utilize. So that's the first component of the bill. The second component of the, of the bill directs council staff, um, that's myself, to direct a more permanent rule that this council could consider to fix this on a permanent basis so that we don't have a long-term stay of enforcement. And that permanent rule would be proposed to this council as a part of this year's IDO annual update. Um, Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, I can answer any questions about the zoning pieces of this discussion, and I think Director Gruner is here from the Economic Development Department if there are uh, questions outside of zoning. Councilor Lewis. Mr. President, I was going to say if the director wants to come and say Excellent. a few words about this, if anybody has any questions for the department as well. Director Gruner, welcome. Thank you, Council President, Councilors, uh, Council Lewis, thank you. Uh, Max Gruner with the Economic Development Department. I would urge you to uh, support uh, this, this bill. Uh, as you know, uh, the film industry in the state and in the city is a huge economic driver for us every day. We're competing with Atlanta, we're competing with Vancouver, and every day I'm very proud of the film staff because we're absolutely at a point where we can go head to head uh, with those more established uh, film ecosystems. This is something that I think is really exciting because it merges the need of an industry 
with the desire of property owners to, to come together and in a temporary way activate uh, lots in the city for film. So again, I, I, I thank your consideration uh, for, for this proposal. Uh, as you can tell, I'm, I'm very excited about it and I'll, I'd be happy to stand for any questions. With that, are there any questions? Oh, Councillor Peeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I just had a quick question on the language around when this expires. Um, it says that it expires within one year or when this year's IDO passes. If this year's IDO passes really soon and this isn't in it, the stay isn't going to be a very long stay. Is, is that correct? Mr. Sure. President, Councillor Feeblecorn, um, yes, the idea is that staff would have this ready in time prior to when the council takes final action on O2377, which is this year's IDO annual update bill, that that would be an amendment that could be considered by the council uh, as soon as June 5th. Okay, so we're not, we're not worried at all about cutting it. I, I don't wanna stay until, you know, June 5th, right? Like <laughs> Mr. President, Councillor Feeblecorn, um, yeah, I, I, staff is not concerned about the timelines as they're proposed in the bill based on uh, the wishes of the sponsor to get a permanent rule in place this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Mainly staff's not concerned because you're not concerned and you're the staff, right? Mr. President, correct. I am the staff and I am not concerned. Great. Councilors, other questions? Councilor Lewis to close. Thank you, Mr. President. And I don't think I can say it any better than the, you know, the director and, the, and our staff. And the so thank you all. And thank uh, you for your support. I urge your support. This is a good bill. Thanks. Councilors, all those in favor, say yes. Raise your hand. Any opposed? That matter carries unanimously. Thank you all. Uh, let's see what we're going to do with this. Um, I think we'll, have to, we'll just take the rest of these in order here. So, Councilor Sanchez and Grout, uh, P1. Kind of related to R131 as well. So that's correct. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Councilor Sanchez and Grout, P1, adopting a proposition uh, to be sent to the voters at the 2023 regular general uh, election, proposing to amend the Albuquerque City Charter to adopt a council manager form of government. I voted do pass, and there is also a floor sub. And your co sponsor is the second. And just for procedure uh, sake here for folks following along, so this would be a proposed charter amendment which requires at least two public hearings. So no matter what tonight, this will be the first of two public hearings on this matter, and so we'll have to defer it at least until a future meeting um, to be determined by the sponsors. So, Councilor Sanchez. That's correct. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, this floor sub is basically um, to get it on the ballot, proposition to be sent to the voters and make sure that uh, we adopt an alternate form of government, city unit manager form of government, and um, do we dis I can discuss it more, or do we have the signed Let's move yeah. the floor sub first. So okay. you've made a motion. So I'll move the floor, floor sub. Second it. Let's discuss the motion to approve the floor sub, and then we can talk about the substance if that's okay. Okay, thank you. So on the process to approve the floor sub, Councilor uh, Bassan. Mr. President, it's it's only a comment to staff to please, please double check for clerical errors in here. I won't belabor the, the point. There's some spelling mishaps. Great. Uh, other comments on the motion for, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rayal. I think our staff does. Let's see if you do. Let's, we'll take the vote on the motion while you guys uh, review that. So all those in favor of the floor substitute, uh, raise your hand and say yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All any opposed? Councillor Jones is a no, and Councillor Feeblecorn is a no on the floor sub. That matter carries seven to two. We are on the bill as substituted back to the sponsors on the merits. Thank you, and I would like to actually start out the conversation by uh, referring to um, Ms. Uh, Ronquil. Thank you, Mr. President and Councillor Sanchez. Uh, this bill proposes to submit a city charter amendment question to the voters at the city's regular local election to be held on November 7th of this year. 
If approved by the voters, this charter amendment would change the city's form of government from the current mayor council form to a council manager form, which would consist of a governing body and a professional administrator who would function as city manager and chief administrative officer. The proposed council manager form would still include a role for the mayor, where the mayor is integrated into the council as its uh, presiding member, um, who would have a, um, some more limited duties as opposed to being part of a separate branch of government. The charter amendment would also create the city manager position and reallocate certain powers and duties that previously belonged to the mayor to this new city manager. All right, unless the councilors have a different proposal, we have a couple of public comment speakers, and so we'll I think usually let them come, and then we'll uh, ask, uh, get it back to the sponsors and take other questions. Uh, so we'll begin with Mr. Krebs, Mr. Timothy Krebs. It is good to see you, sir. Nice to see you. Uh, President Davis and counselors, my name is Tim Krebs. I'm a professor of political science at UNM. I specialize in urban politics and policy. I rise to speak about the proposal to change the city's form of government to council manager. I do not support this idea for the following reasons. One, uh, council manager systems place executive power in the hands of an unelected city manager answerable, answerable to the entire city council. City council. We already have a professional city administrator in the person of the CAO, answerable to the mayor who is recognized as responsible for the administrative function of city government. Three, our city requires a strong executive political leader. Our city is large and it's complicated as evidenced by the turnout tonight. The benefits of the council manager system do not outweigh the costs of changing from our current system which are mainly on the voter engagement and participation front. Most US cities do employ the council manager system, but most cities over 500,000 do not. Among 37 US cities with 2020 populations greater than 500,000, 14 use the council manager system, while all others except for Portland, which uses a commission system, employ a mayor, a mayor council form. Five of the 14 council manager cities are in Texas, two are in Arizona, and one is in California. Um, the most important difference between cities with council manager systems and those with mayor council plans is voter engagement, with council manager cities lagging far behind mayor council cities. This is because the executive power is not exercised by an, by an elected official. It is at arm's length from the public. Indeed, among large U.S. cities with the lowest average turnout in mayoral elections, seven of eight have council manager systems. Austin. Uh, Professor, go ahead. Finish your thoughts quick. Uh, Austin, Oklahoma City, El Paso, San Antonio, Las Vegas, Fort Worth, and Dallas. In cities with low voter turnout, minority voters are often the ones who stay home, harming descriptive representation and policy responsiveness to low-income communities. At a time when our democracy is struggling, Let's not create more disincentives for people to participate through voting. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Domiski. Okay, you're up. Thank you. My name is Ted Domiski. What I know about government. Well, let me refresh. Go to state of New Mexico, every state in the United States. And the federal government has three branches, right? Yes. You have to say yes. What we have here in the city of Albuquerque? Two. Now, what you try to do? Make it one branch. Well, that's going to be, isn't that about money? For every one of you, yes, of course. That well, let's skip it. I I remember when Joseph Stalin died. When I was in grade school, my native country Poland started becoming instead socialism, communism. Soon I left army, 
I, it is, uh, that's got job to lead the Africa, decide not to. Now, new government after the revolution in the 80s, early 80s, we have parliament on the top and premier, like in England. Well, where are we going here? No, that's exactly like in England, in Poland, the Polish government. And everywhere you go, public buildings are named after saints and so on. Where are we going here now? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Cornelius, you have some Zoom speakers. Thank you, Mr. President. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, first up, we have Mara Alana Bernstein, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. Hello, thank you, Council President, everyone who's here tonight. I'm Mara Alana Bernstein. I was the Deputy Director of the Environmental Health Department's Air Quality Program uh, for a couple of years until 2022. I experienced firsthand the dysfunction, mismanagement, and lack of accountability in this city's government. The mayor's administration consistently ignores expert advice, um, and I have a few examples. For uh, background on me, I have a master's in public administration in environmental science from Columbia University and nearly 20 years working on air quality and climate change. Uh, when I was at the city, I alerted the administration to the serious health impacts of ground level ozone, commonly known as smog, um, but unfortunately this wasn't a priority. Uh, ozone aggravates lung diseases, especially in children, and it can even cause premature death. Because I've dedicated my career to protecting public health, I did all I could to reduce ozone. Uh, a council manager form of government could have empowered me to do more, better, faster. Second, I advise the administration that the air quality program could permit and regulate greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act. This did not happen. Also during my tenure, I reported salary discrimination based on sex, harassment of female employees, potential legal malpractice, and the impending bankruptcy of the air quality program. No meaningful action was taken except when EHD director Angel Martinez wrongfully terminated my position. For these reasons and many others, I support a council manager form of government. I believe it will add much needed oversight and accountability to this administration. Thank you for your time. Rosemary Blanchard, followed by Peggy Neff. Hello, members of the council, President Davis. I was kind of shocked when I saw these two uh, measures on the agenda to uh, put out to a vote a uh, council manager and an honorary mayor sort of government. I couldn't really understand <laughs> why you would even keep the mayor under the form that you had, since the mayor basically does nothing except break tie votes. And if you have an uneven number on the council, you don't need to worry about tie votes. So it seems to me that this proposal is really, as the first gentleman said, it is trying to re remove one branch of government from city government in Albuquerque. I'm not always satisfied with what the mayor is doing, but at least I get to vote for the mayor. And the mayor that I'm voting for gets to manage and operate the administrative side of the city. Uh, as much as I've been uh, disagreed with various things that the mayor has done, I have appreciated the forward, the forward uh, look from that department, from that branch of government. And frankly, the, uh, the council seems only able to stop each other from doing things rather than really moving forward. We may have a problem with our executive, but I haven't seen in the council the solution to that. And the manager form seems to me would simply be moving the city to become even more static in a time of change when we need to be uh, 
we need to be looking to the future as to how to develop our city so that it's a place for everyone to live. This comes right on the heels of trying to minimize the resources available to the less being thanks to the less uh, opulent in our city. And I don't think that council manager is going to do anything for those most disadvantaged in the city. It's not going to make us as broad based a community as we could be by working on improving what we've got now. Thank so you, Ms. Blanchard. I hope you don't make us less democratic even than we are. Thank you. Thank you, Rosemary. Peggy Neff. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I did try to speak at general comment. Many times I'm not able to speak because for some reason I can't be found, but I signed up tonight to speak on three things and I'd like to speak on this one. I stand against this amendment. I have to agree with many of the things that have been said already to um, it, it give you opportunity for different things instead of this amendment. I would suggest that we change the IDO to disallow, dis allow draconian zone changes such as the mayor's housing forward initiative. I think that substantive amendments in the IDO need to be recognized as substantive amendments and they need data and they need public comment and they need thorough vetting by our city for citywide changes. You've heard that all before. You could also draft and pass an ordinance where city councilors are required to represent their neighborhoods, go to district coalition meetings, participate in discussions with the neighborhoods. You could enhance neighborhoods. You could enhance ONC. You could create a positive flow for involvement in the city, therefore then providing oversight for the mayor's office. I think that you should stick to task force recommendations. If you're going to have a task force, you should have the task force recommendations be enacted unless they fall against different measures, standards that you could also draft and put into place. But taking a change and taking away the democratic processes, we see it so much now in this mayor's work. I wonder if the mayor is not behind doing this. So perhaps you need to look at not only strengthening democratic processes within the mayor's office, but within the city itself. Thank you. Mr. President, that concludes comment on P23-1. Thank you. And uh, judging by the calls I've gotten from the mayor, I don't think the mayor's behind this, but you know, I could be wrong. Um, all right, back to the counselors, Councillor Sanchez. Yes, there's a, I think there's a couple more people that are in the audience that had signed up to speak. Uh, Mr. President, Councillor Sanchez, we do have uh, two more speakers for R23-131, which I believe... Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, why don't we do this? Since both of those items are sort of related, let's just take those together, um, and then we, that way the council can dispose of both of these together, since they're going to have to be deferred anyway. Very good, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Jessica Morning, followed by Rosemary Blanchard. Um, first of all, I'd like to say, thank President Davis and the council members for listening to my words. I would also like to specifically call out Madam Vice President Grout and Councillor Sanchez for working together to hopefully put Albuquerque on a path for real progress with regards to the proposal to restructuring into a council, council city manager form of government. As a, lifelong, <clears throat> excuse me, as a lifelong resident of Albuquerque, I have to admit I've never seen it this bad, and I think most people can agree especially of those that have grown up here and have seen the decline, much of which has occurred in the last several years. When people ask, why don't you move? Well, I'll tell you why. Because the city is filled with good people, my family, my friends, and I believe Albuquerque has an amazing untapped potential. I know that Albuquerque is worth fighting for, and I'm tired of the excuses of the current mayor and many in his administration saying, well, the entire country has problems. I don't care about what's going on in other places. I care about Albuquerque, and those excuses from Mayor Keller are basically telling me, I cannot fix anything or make the city any better, so just deal with it. But I don't think we should be okay with this. It's like boiling a lobster. We keep getting the temperature of crime and homelessness turned up on us, and we have become accustomed to the heat of failure. Mayor Keller has been in the news time and time again for bad decisions, and these are the ones that the public knows about. I don't know how many Larry Barker reports need to be aired before the mayor is finally put in check. 
Six months ago, the journal, a journal poll gave the mayor a 33% approval rating, and I would like to hope the citizens have finally recognized that he is the wrong person to run the city. He's eroded the position of mayor, and it's time to pivot. I am respectfully asking that you put this on the ballot so perhaps the citizens as a whole can vote on this and make real progress towards fulfilling the potential of what we know Albuquerque is capable of. Thank you. Ms. Rose. Blanchard, if you're still here, you're technically next, but uh, I know we've heard from you on this matter already. Yeah, I think you've heard from me on this matter already, uh, Mr. Davis, and uh, I'm not gonna take another two minutes on it because you know what I think and feel on this. I think there are many things that could be improved in our city government, and I would like to see the council work on improving the council and look and, and improving the office of mayor, but and providing more checks and balances and ways for people to become to be accounted for and to become involved in their city government. I don't have a hard time finding people who work in the city. I go look them up and then I go call them and then I make appointments and I go see them. It works. But I am concerned with us shrinking to essentially one branch of government. I don't think, I haven't seen the council dealing with a lot of our critical issues all that successfully either. We weren't able to do anything to give tenants even the right to find out what kind of fees they might be paying later on. That was not something the mayor's office did. That was something the council managed to do. So I think we all need to get each of our own houses in order and the city needs to trust democracy enough to try to work to make it work. Less democracy is not gonna make us a better city. That's all. Thank you, Ms. Blanchard. Mr. Cornelius, is that all of our speakers on this bill? Yes, Mr. President. Mr. Cornelius, is Ms. Neff still in the, as a panelist or has she exited now? Let me take a look. Peggy now. Mr. President, I do not see Ms. Okay. Neff. Uh, Councilor Brisson had asked if we could ask her to give her a moment to speak on 055 in the way it was deferred. And so we'll get that message to her and we know we'll see her at the next meeting and be sure that we can get her up on top of the list since we missed her this time. Thanks. All right, Councilors, we are back on the bill as substituted. I'm gonna go to the sponsors first, uh, just to sort of mention what they're doing here. Um, and then we'll see where this debate takes us. Here's what I'm thinking though. We know this gets deferred. I'm not trying to cut debate off, but Y'all know we're not gonna extend this whole thing all night and we still have a whole budget. So I'm trying to hope that by nine we can hit the budget. Is that cool? Maybe. Let's see where we go. Thank you, Mr. President, appreciate it. Thank you, Councillor Grout. And one of the things that we we're looking at here is just all the different comments. How's that working for you right now, citizens of Albuquerque? You know, we're seeing, we're seeing the most homicides we've ever had in the last several years. We're seeing a lot of things that could be changed um, us as city councilors are time and time again very, very frustrated about how certain things are hand handled um, during the administration. We try to work with the administration day in and day out, but we oftentimes see that the administration doesn't seem to work back with us or the citizens of Albuquerque. So when we're dealing with these issues, um, and I know for me, I'm speaking for me, and I know I'm speaking for some of the other councilors, uh, we have given lists of things that our constituents have passed down to us and still have not been taken care of. Um, if anybody wants to see my list of emails that I've sent to the administration, there's plenty. And those are the those are the things that we are seeing that they're not taking care of us. We heard somebody talk about, about the amount of mismanagement we're at. We heard somebody else talk about all, and then we heard both sides of the story. So hearing both sides of the story, you know, what we're doing here is we're doing everything we can to make sure that we are on the right path, and it looks like we are, because we're getting these, we're getting the dialogue, and we're getting this, this information. So what we definitely need to do as a council is we need to get this to the to the voters, so that the voters can make the decision in reference to this. I think it's very, very important and responsible for us hearing both sides of these arguments that we get this bill to the to the voters. It's imperative that each one of us here vote to get this to the, to the voters because that's where we need to go. That's what we need to do. If the voters tell us we need to change the government, we change it. If the voters tell us no, we stay where we're at, we stay. But it's our responsibility to listen to the voters as city councilors in this area. And that, to me, is the biggest talking point 
and the biggest thing that we need to face right now. And look at what's going on our, in our city. When you have this current mayor's form of government, you have individuals who are coming in and then leaving. We can't even succeed as a city to get anything done in, the, in, in four to eight years that uh, this form of government is actually in place. I mean, you can look to other uh, other citizens, uh, I mean, other cities in, in our region, specifically Phoenix. I hope everybody understands this, but in the 60s and 70s, um, when we were actually fighting to become the economic hub of the Southwest, and we all know where that went, um, we had abundance of gas, we had abundance of oil, we had water, we had a national uh, a base, an Air Force base, we had a national lab. We, we should have been the economic driver of the Southwest. It should not have gone to our sister city out there. The difference, the main difference was the fact that we had a strong mayor form of government and that couldn't continue with processes that were put in place early on and continue to develop those processes as we move forward to make the city better. Instead, we've remained in a situation where every single four to eight years, a whole brand new way of thinking comes in. And that's why I say it's so important for the citizens to make the decision on what we're doing here in Albuquerque because it's the citizens that vote each of us into office. So I urge that if you are listening to what we're talking about, I urge that you, that you actually listen to your constituents and give them the opportunity that they deserve to determine how they feel that they need to be governed. Thank you. Councilor Grout. Oh, let me go, uh, let's go ahead, take Councilor Grout, then we'll go to the other council. Thank you, Dad. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, I want to make this clear. It's not about the mayor. It's about the mayor and the council being more efficient. And I think that's what's lacking. Um, it's not just now, but it, in the past. Um, like Councillor Sanchez said, um, every when a new mayor comes in, they hire all new staff, um, you know, directors. Um, a lot of them can be political appointees. And, um, and they might not be the best for the job. And we need, to be, we need to have accountability. We need to have efficiency. We do need to have transparency. I think that's very important. But when, if, if a mayor comes in and doesn't like things that were done before, he stop, he or she um, will um, stop that process, hire somebody new, um, and then they start all over. And so we don't grow. Some of the um, things in the past weren't so good, and so I could see a reason for some change. But oftentimes, things are very good. Um, one thing in particular I'll just point out, um, I could do a couple of things, actually. Um, the director for ACS, I, I really do like this program. I think it's a great program. I think it needs some tweaking a little bit, and I think they're working on it. They're very young, and so I know that they're, they're going to do better and, and all. But the director said, I, I don't know if the next mayor is going to like this job, and we might be booted. And I don't know that that's, we're putting an awful lot of money into that program and a lot of effort. And I would hate for the next mayor to think, no, I don't like this program. We're not going to do it anymore. Um, and it's not about politics to me, for me. It's about um, growing the right direction. Um, and then... Um, the sawmill district. I think the rail trail is a wonderful opportunity for our city to, um, for economic development, for um, tourism, um, and I think it's a great, great idea. And the mayor even said, if the next mayor doesn't like it, because it's going to take a long time to develop, and he said, hopefully the next mayor will like it. There's always that possibility that the next mayor won't like it. Um, and I, instead of, I want to take politics out of what we're doing and doing what's best for the, for the citizens. Um, when you look around at um, the cities around us that do have the council manager form of government, 
The manager is responsible for finding the best directors. We have great directors, so I'm, I'm not specifically talking about anybody. Um, but there's always that possibility that, that they also need to be accountable, and the manager needs to be accountable. Um, and I think with this council manager form of government, I think there will be a lot more accountability. I think that we can move forward better. Uh, we will be, as a council, we will um, listen to constituents better. I think the mayor will listen to constituents better. I want the mayor to be, still represent our city and be the leader, be, be up here and, and um, creating the agenda and setting the um, committee appointments and all of those things. So he is, he or she is very, um, very much part of this process. Um, if the voters, we need to be listening to the voters. If they don't like it, we don't change. But if they do, let's make some changes. Um, also, back in the day, um, we did have a commission form of government, I think. Um, there were three commissioners. This was back in the 70s, I believe, um, even before then. Um, and there were three commissioners. There were not counselors. There, so we didn't have the diff different districts appointed. Um, so I think that there, this would be different. Um, when you look at the, the communities around us, they're very successful. And, um, and I, just, I just hope for our future for our children's future, I, I just think that it's a, it could very well be a good possibility. Again, when you look at the cities around us, they are thriving, they are, they are prospering, um, they are growing, and um, those are my first thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, counselors. Let's go to counselors with questions. Counselor Lewis, did you have something else that were helpful? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you, Ms. President. A uh, question for the, the staff here. So the, at what point is the language, or, or where is the language in the bill uh, that is, um, is the ballot language? Is it, is it um, so I'm seeing on page two where it starts with the proposal, goes about 10 pages. Is that, is that essentially the ballot language? Uh, Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, the um, language that will be put on the ballot should this proposition be approved is actually in R131. Um, so that, that text is contained in that other bill. Okay. So in this, in this bill, there's none of this. Uh, it's obviously not the ballot language. It's, okay. That's why there's two bills. Right. Mr. President, Councilor Lewis, the uh, proposition um, includes like a, a very long, um, like full text of what okay. the amendments would be. And then the resolution is condensed so that it would fit on uh, the ballot. Oh, I got you. Okay. And then, uh, so just uh, on, on page 12, if you'll look at just page 13, Section or just line one. Uh, I'm just assuming this this is not this doesn't fit in this bill that maybe it's a an error. Why would it be so the public vote on performing arts center? I'm looking at the floor substitute. Uh, it's it's page thirteen, um, line one. On the uh, floor sub. Mr. President and Councillor Lewis, um, that particular section of the of the charter, the the bill that you're looking at, references a renumbering of that section. Um, it is, I guess, uh, could be characterized as odd language for the charter, but it was apparently put there through a ballot initiative at some point. Um, an issue of the day, apparently, being a performing arts center that that the the voters wanted to restrict the city from from acting upon. So this bill would not uh, affect that particular section other than recognize that it would need to be renumbered. Uh, okay. Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just, I've had a couple of conversations with, uh, well, a couple, many, many conversations <laughs> with um, constituents. And I just wanted to make a few things clear and, and ask Ms. Ronquillo to tell me if I'm wrong on any of this, but now, this is not a, a referendum on the current mayor. Um, the way this is written is the, the current mayor will finish his term, um, and then this change would take place. 
So I've heard a lot of comments from my constituents in here tonight that are upset about the current mayor, and I just want to make that very clear that, that you know, there was a referendum on the mayor about a year and a half ago, and he won re-election. And so this is about what's the best form of government for the city of Albuquerque, um, not about the current mayor. And I've, I'm still reaching out to folks in other cities and having those conversations, but again, it's just not about you know, one mayor. It's about what form of government really works for Albuquerque, what has the best checks and balances, what will get us what I think all of the voters want, which is a thriving community. So thank you. I see the clock approaching my own timeline. Um, so let me just add, um, I, I agree with Council People Court. Like we have to be clear what this is and what it's not. I realize some folks want to assign different agendas to it and maybe that's politically expedient in some cases. Um, I'm honestly not sure what to do with this. What I am sure of is we can't make this decision on such a big structural change to the way the city operates in just a couple of weeks. And so I'm glad the charter requires us to at least have a couple of hearings so that we can get more input. What that reminds me of is that there are deadlines for getting things on the ballot. And so I want to ask, I don't see our clerk, Mr. Watson, here, but somebody's pointing at the TV. Oh, there's Ethan. Mr. Clerk, what good timing you have is as if we planned this. Um, Mr. Watson, can you remind us, what is the schedule here, the last possible date this council could pass something to ensure it gets on the ballot without having to go to the court and argue with the county? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, are you, is the council able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, I would need to file any resolutions uh, on ballot measures. I would need to file any resolutions on ballot measures with the county 70 days before the election, which by my count is August 29th. Um, I would, because there's three election resolutions that the council needs to pass in the in near future, I would encourage the council to perhaps try and do this before the July break. Um, we do have the election resolution, the bond resolution, and potentially this one, which is a lot, um, but um, the very last day possible would be the 29th, but there is a lot that needs to happen before that gets to the county, so just earlier is better in my mind. Thank you, Mr. Watson. Um, I think that reminds us that I know we have to do this on the 5th. There's been some conversation, and I'm not necessarily opposed to it, depending on where the sponsors and the council wants to go to continue that conversation to our first meeting in August. But I wanted to be sure we understand sort of the danger of that, whether you're for it or against it. Like, that's kind of the deadline we're on, and we kind of are stuck with that. Um, like, we can pass this in October, but it's not getting on the ballot. So um, we do have to have this conversation. I, I, let me say this, though. I think... You know, it's no secret that every mayor and every council has an adversarial relationship at some point. Um, this is another option, and I'm kind of in principle think this might solve a lot of our challenges we have, um, but voters created this adversarially on purpose, right? We had to get to the best ideas that the most people could get behind and do well and resource appropriately. Um, I think a lot of our challenges here are less about the fights between the administration and the council for resourcing things um, and about the oversight by the independent agencies and others that keep us all accountable to each other um, for our rules, right? Um, but I do think this makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. Um, I do think we would have done more housing had we had the mayor sitting in this room negotiating with us at this table on how much money we could spend in what order. Um, and with no particular person in mind, but if there's a director responsible for housing um, and they have to account to all of the council more or less and a manager, I think there's a little more, um, I, I, we have seen in other governments um, that there's more cooperation um, and less adversarial sort of gotcha moments. That said, we're a big city, it's really complex uh, in terms right, like this is not easy um, and you can't have nine mayors. Um, and so that's even worse. So I'm not sure what I think about this, to be perfectly honest. What I know is we get another bite at the apple um, at some point, and so I want to ask the sponsors when they want to do this. But I see that uh, Councilor Benton and maybe Councilor Pena have a quick follow-up here, and then we're going to go to the sponsors to ask when they want to defer this, whether to June 5th or June 21st. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, I mean, I appreciate the discussion, right? And it's an important discussion and it's good food for thought about where we ought to be going. Um, I would venture to guess that when Pete Domenici and those guys changed the form of government, whenever it was back in the early 70s, that there was a fair amount 
uh, wrangling and discussion about how the new form of government was going to look. And then I recall that at Y2K, right around Y2K, the turn of the century, as we old timers call it, <laughs> um, <laughs> there was quite a bit of discussion about a consolidated metro government for Bernalillo County. And it was a serious discussion, and there was a lot of discussion that went into it. And um, I think these are healthy discussions. I can't argue with the fact that, yeah, whenever a new mayor came in, you know, there was kind of an upset apple cart, and a lot of things got left behind in, in the apple cart that was, that was uh, thrown off the road. But... Um, it, it, and, and I think that's, that is kind of an inherent thing that happens, you know. There's a new logo on the cars, and there's a new sheriff in town, or actually, excuse me, mayor in town. And so, um, I, you know, some suggestions have been made. Should we have some sort of joint body between the administration and the council to have some discussions about this more? Um, but uh, I, um, I can't say that, that I don't understand the motivation to bring this forward because uh, it's painful sometimes. I mean, we, let's face it, we've had, we've had major transportation projects that were proposed, and I'm not going to even name which ones they were, but they may not be <laughs> the ones that some people are thinking about that begins with A. Uh, there were prior ones with a prior mayor, and then another mayor came in, and then another thing happened, and et cetera, right? And we've had, um, we've had actions of, of the council where, let's just say, like on an economic, economic development matter, where under the previous mayor, the council voted eight to one to do something, and a new mayor comes in and goes, oh, we want to get rid of that. We're not going to do it. So, uh, you know, that's a problem. That's a structural problematic hiccup. That's a big old hiccup that happens. So, um, these are things we all ought to be thinking about. How can we be more effective? And and I've always been a, you know, defender of the council and the council's in authority and integrity, but it's limited. And um, um, so it's understandable that, that uh, people feel like there's some something we can do better. I personally don't know <laughs> whether this is it. Um, I'm not convinced. Uh, but I, I think um, let's all talk amongst ourselves because I think, um, you know, the council is widely represented of, of different interest groups in the city, and that's the idea. Um, I don't know. I, I, I was interested uh, with Professor Krebs, and, and maybe we could have some more discussions about what he's seen in some of these other cities that, that do have uh, more of this form of government, but maybe combined with a metro approach and a, and a countywide approach, you know. Mm -hmm. So um, what have we solved, or what have I solved? I'm just, I'm just musing on I'm what we're talking about, but it's a very important subject, so I appreciate uh, it Count being brought forward. Councilor Pena. Thank you, Mr. President. Yeah, and all these conversations are, are very healthy conversations. I know that um, Councilor Grout, you know, she talked to me when she was considering um, putting this forward, you know, and I, I've been um, just on, on council now that I'm just starting my third term. I guess I'm a year into it, but then been doing the community work for 30 plus years, and you know, you see so many changes you see good mayors you see bad mayors you see you know um, working with the county they have they have that that type of structure you can see the pros and cons to, to both right so I mean it, it's kind of a difficult uh, it's a, a difficult conversation to be had but I think it's one to at least um, at least have it but um, I think Councillor Benton talked about uh, you know consolidation I think that's a conversation that definitely yep. needs to be had right um, whether if this passes or, or, or doesn't pass 
or doesn't pass, I think, you know, working with the county throughout these years and, and just seeing how, especially in District 3, and I'm sure there's other districts like that, but in District 3 in particular, you know, you have one side of the street that's city, one side of the street that's county, and it just really, um, you know, we have our property taxes that come out of the county, and then, you know, some of the discussions with the money for the behavioral health uh, tax, you know, we can't spend it, but it's really coming from some of the citizens in, in Albuquerque, you know, that's the decision of the county. So when we talk about APD in the Sheriff's Department, I, I think um, as we're having this conversation, we should also um, have the conversation about um, consolidation. So thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Councilors, any other discussion on this matter? And if not, we're going to go back to the sponsors for a motion for a deferral. Uh, Councilor Lewis for on the subject. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, I, you know, I'd suggest that we not wait too long, that we just continue to have the discussion. I, I do think um, that it's important that the council, that we should go line by line you know, through this. We should have some really in-depth discussions on this and hear from the public. I don't, think, I don't see any reason to delay it beyond what it needs to be, uh, to be, have, have the proper forums. Um, and even, you know, I would like to hear maybe from some other, you know, some of the other cities and maybe some even consultants or experts that might even um, you know, talk about you know, other cities that have, that, have, that have made the transition to the form of government that we have right now uh, to this form of government. But I like this discussion. I like the discussion about the county city merging. Um, I like the dis discussion of uh, a new uh, west side city, Albuquerque West. Yeah. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> better known as District 5, but... Uh, um, I'm kidding, but these are, you know, it, it boils down to you know, how we want to govern, you know, ourselves and how we best think that, uh, um, you know, city government can provide the best return, you know, to, uh, to the taxpayer, you know, uh, on, the, on their tax dollar. And so, um, you know, certainly think that this discussion has merit. I think we should, um, you know, we've got to iron out these details. I mean, I, I know that the next resol the resolution is critically important that we get the wording and everything correct and right. Um, and the right size font, all those, all those things are just things that mm -hmm. got to be worked out. So I, I wouldn't see any reason to delay it beyond what it needs to. Thank you. Back to the sponsors for the motion on deferral. Mr. President, I move a deferral to June 5th. Is there a second? There's a second. Is there any discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of the deferral until June 5th on the committee sub say yes, raise your hand. That looks unanimous. Great. Uh, councilors, we have discussed this already, but now we're on R131. Councilors, somebody to motion. We could do the same thing with this one. Yep. And I think that's what we should do. Um, we'll do the same thing. We'll motion, make a motion to defer to June 5th. Actually, I think what you want to do is do a do pass and then a floor sub, right? So we have a motion and a second on the do pass. We have the same sponsors, which are the same sponsors, on the motion for the floor sub with a second. Is there any discussion on the floor sub? And seeing none, if the clerk is ready, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. That is for the floor sub. We're back on the bill as substituted to the sponsors. We have a, de a deferral to June 5th. Councilor Groutman moves the deferral until June 5th. Councilor Sanchez seconds. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand, please. Thank you. Is the clerk good? That one's unanimous. Sorry, folks, this is the end of the evening. We start to get fast, and I move fast, and then we miss votes. So trying to slow us down just a little bit. But here's the big ticket, uh, Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, R-122, Committee Substitute, establishing one-year objectives for the City of Albuquerque in fiscal year 2024 to meet five-year goals. I move a due pass. We have a motion and a second from Councilor Feeblecorn. I heard first Councilor Bassan back on the move, on the bill. Uh, Mr. President, I... Defer to you on which amendment you want to call first. If you want to go on the packets, there's five of them that I know of. Uh, and just, Mr. Cornelius, I'll just confirm. I don't have any, we don't have any speakers on objectives, right? We have several on the bill itself. Okay, great. Just checking. All right, uh, let's just take them in order, folks. Amendment A, which is Councilor Benton, transit. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Mr. Cornelius, we can't hear you. Disregard. Yes. Okay. Councillor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. Amendment A, which we'll call floor amendment number one, if you're ready. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll move floor amendment number one. This uh, is under the human and family development uh, goal or uh, objectives and goal. 
on page 2, objective 8, line 20 through 21, revise the last sentence to read, new network concept decision to be completed and reported by the end of the second quarter of FY24. This is a transit uh, uh, objective, and um, the transit department is working on new network concepts, as you know, and this is really setting a uh, end of the, uh, halfway through the, the uh, 24 quarter for them to report on a recommendation uh, for uh, a new route uh, system. So we have a motion from Councillor Benton, a second from Councillor Feeblecorn to be sure the clerk catches up with us. I think we're moving faster than everybody else and that's okay. We're good. Benton Feeblecorn. Anything from the administration? Our Director Keener, who's very popular tonight, but she says no. She's seen enough of us. Councillors, any discussion? All those in favor on the amendment number one, say yes and raise your hand. Yes. That is unanimous 9-0. Councillor Benton, you also have uh, Amendment B, which we'll call Amendment 2. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, amendment number 2 to Committee Sub R23-122. Um, this is a uh, family, family community services uh, lead um, uh, objective, and this is proposing to... Uh, to do a classroom and workshop uh, space at the West Side Shelter. Um, this would add uh, some language that says to provide some outdoor shaded seated area, seating areas for the clients as well. And I had really originally read it, written it with describing the expansive views of the Rio Grande <laughs> Valley from the shelter, but all kidding aside, they're pretty nice. And it obviously, we want to make it a, a welcoming place for anyone who's interested in actually staying out at the West Side Shelter. So there's your support on that. Thank you. And that's amendment number two. We have a second from Councillor Grout. Is there any, any questions or comment from councillors? Anything from the administration? That's a no. All those in favor say yes on floor amendment two. Yes. Any opposed? That matter carries. Next up is uh, amendment C, floor amendment number three. Um, this is mine sort of by default. Uh, Councilors will remember that this was an objective we held back uh, to let APD uh, legal and our staff sort of tweak this language just a little bit to, to comply with the CASA, um, but this relates to their in-service training uh, relating to the CASA, so I'll move a f to pass on floor amendment three. We have a second from, I heard Council Feeblecorn, because my right ear is better. Uh, I know Mr. Sylvan and D.C. Lowe had worked on this. I just want to ask Ms. Keefe, is legals okay with this language in terms of CASA compliance? Yes, Councilor Davis. We, um, I reviewed this with D.C. Lowe to make sure it was accurate. Councilor Bassan, this was a little modification from original, but you're okay with that? Yes, Mr. President. Great. Councilors, any other questions on floor amendment number three? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Yes. 9-0, moving on. Councilor Bassan. D4. Mr. President, I'd like to move amendment number four. This is adding an objective. The Office of Equity and Inclusion shall establish performance attributes and measures as part of the annual budget process. Performance attributes and measurements should be consistent with the mission of OEI to increase local purchasing, increase doing business with companies owned by people of color, invest in areas of the city that have been underinvested, and ensuring the city delivers services in an equitable and inclusive manner. OEI shall provide the attributes and measurements to the City Council by first quarter ending fiscal year 24, and the office shall also provide quarterly updates to the City Council going forward. We have a second from Councillor Grout. Councillors, any questions on this amendment? Anything from the administration? Mr. Rao, anything on OEI? Seeing nothing from the administration, all those in favor say yes, raise your hand. Amendment 4 passes unanimously. Moving on to Amendment 5, we are back to Councillor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, floor Amendment Number 5, um, I can I'll first describe what it is and then I can read it. Um, so Fire Station 4 is the one that's right next to Coronado Park. Uh, the administration decided a couple of years back, or maybe it was only a year ago, to close uh, Coronado Park. Um, since then, a rather rapidly moving plan developed to uh, um, to expand the fire station facilities there adjacent to Coronado Park. Uh, that's one of the older stations. It needs an update, et cetera. Um, but also to include a training facility, which would use up quite a bit of the real estate of the old Coronado Park. Um, I'm in regular 
discussions, of course, with the Wells Park neighborhood, who are my constituents, and they're losing a park, and um, uh, you know, their other neighbors in the immediate area are, are losing a park uh, the way things are going right now. Um, the plans I've seen of the uh, fire facilities uh, have some some veggies growing around the perimeter of the buildings, but um, it, it doesn't really look to me like a park. So this is a more, dis a more specific description of a half an acre park. Um, that's roughly a half of a city block, I think, or thereabouts, if you wanted to gauge that of a standard 300 some odd by 300 some odd city block that you would see in the older parts of the city. It's roughly that size. But to have something that of some substance and that that be developed along with this, uh, this uh, fire facility, fire and rescue facility. So um, the objective reads on page three after line four, objective five, in cooperation and coordination with parks and recreation, design and construct an urban public park of at least one half acre as part of the construction, renovation, or reconstruction of station four and adjoining training facilities. If necessary to accomplish this and meet training facility standards, purchase additional property adjoining or across the street from the fire facilities for the park, and then renumber subsequent objectives as necessary. Is there a second? We have a second from Councilor Feeblecorn and others. And um, so before we go, we have Councilor Sanchez really quickly. We'll go to the administration next. Mr. President, and um, well, sorry, Mr. Let me get Councilor Sanchez really quickly. We'll come back to you. Sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to ask the administration right. what what exactly kind of park is going to be put on on this surface, and also what is actually going. What kind of training facility do we need? Don't we already have a training facility for um, AFR uh, at this point? Mr. President and Councilor Sanchez, let me uh, ask our fire chief to come and describe to you what um, this training facility is about, and then we'll, we'll talk about the park portion of it, if, if you're okay with that. Chief Harvey and company. Quick question as well, Mr. President, is can we put the train back where it belongs? The train? The train's under steam. Well, the, so the train does move now. It's mobile. Nice. That's something I'd like to see if there's a way to move it there or move it back. It would be, it'd be kind of awesome. All right, uh, Chief, what do you know about trains? Councilor Sanchez, um, so the, the plan for the property at Coronado Park, uh, we have started the design process, and um, I know the, the, probably the design that uh, Councilor Benton is referring to is the one that we used for the press conference. Um, we had thrown that, that exact design together rather quickly for the purpose of the press conference. We had met with the architects about a week prior, um, and so we had asked them to put some green space in, but the final design isn't actually in that rendering of that drawing. Um, to uh, Councillor Sanchez's question re related to our training facility, um, we do have our, our main training facility located at, on the west side at 118th and Central, so very far on the west side. Uh, to maintain our ISO rating, our rating of one, um, we have to put our firefighters through two nine-hour days um, of training on a facility that's located on a certain size of property. And so our thought was with that training facility, um, we could incorporate some of our training more centrally located so that we didn't have personnel driving all the way across the city uh, to the west side for training, um, as th that's our only training location. Um, and so for, the, for this uh, property, the other piece of it is uh, our special operations, our, our uh, wildland response, our heavy technical rescue, and our, um, and our uh, hazardous materials program, they're all the hub right now is also all the way on the west side. So we wanted to centrally locate them in the middle of the city so that they have uh, basically citywide, it's easier for them to get citywide. Uh, so the other part of that plan was to locate all of our special operations in that central location. So that's why we need a little bit more property for that as well. The special operations makes, makes sense, but what exactly, I didn't understand the training. You're gonna, you're just going to bring it to a more centralized location. Um, 
doesn't the facility, the current facility right now, have everything it needs um, to train every firefighter? Are you going to be duplicating effort at that point? Are you going to be bringing some items down that you don't need to bring down? Are we? That's that's my question. Are we going to be duplicating efforts? What's what makes this so different than what you have already on the west side? Uh, Council President, uh, Councilor Sanchez, uh, part of what brings that, uh, which what helps us is it's not a duplication of effort. There, the the training requirement is really uh, interesting because it 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 di dictates how many acres there there has to be in a training tower. And so right now, because we can only train at our location on the west side, we have a really tight training calendar. Uh, we do all of our own um, EMS training and then our, our fire suppression training and then all of our special operations training in one location. Uh, the personnel that can administer training could feasibly train in both locations. And so it opens up our training calendar a bit. We're really tight where uh, as we're trying to provide more training, sometimes we can't fit it into that calendar. And so it geographically, it makes sense for us because we don't have uh, far Northeast Heights stations always having to drive all the way to the west side um, and then back. But also it just allows us for more flexibility and, and being able to get all of that training put in that we need to do. Thank you. Mr. President, Councilors, other questions? Mr. Rayo. Mr. President um, and Councillor Benton, uh, to your uh, amendment, you know, we have talked to the neighborhood um, and uh, we and I have had conversations about our interest in providing some public space there. Um, this uh, is a little more specific. And in and of itself, the, the size is not maybe of a, of a big concern given the end of the, of the amendment that we might have to, if we have to purchase other property. But I would uh, ask you for a friendly uh, maybe amendment is an urban park I know is, is a very different type of park. And I'm uh, wondering if we might be able to take that word out and just say a public park, uh, knowing of your interest of an, in an urban park, and we have talked about that, um, trying to maybe describe that may not be what the neighborhood wants. And so a public park would be something we could work with. Let me let Councilor Benton respond to that, then we're gonna go to Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. Allen, and uh, understood, I did throw that word urban in because we've talked a lot about this area and about, you know, prior to this, the, the, the AFR proposal for this site, um, uh, we talked about, well, what should Coronado Park be? I mean, uh, there's a history in that area which uh, is largely uh, around that area is, or disadvantaged, disinvested neighborhoods. Um, there's a history of removing parks as opposed to building them. Uh, there used to be a park called McClellan Park where the federal courthouse is right now. I know because I used to live right around the corner from it. And it was an urban park. It was kind of more like a plaza type park, you know, almost like you would see in Latin America. It's got trees, it's got greenery, but it's not an active field or, or something that looks like a, a, a more suburban park where you run and throw uh, balls and so forth, but it's more of a, a, a gathering area. Um, and these type of parks you'll see in uh, in urban areas, really, that's a his history, uh, especially on the East Coast, where they'll build a small park within the urban context, and they'll put a, a nice wrought iron six-foot tall fence around it, and that fence is locked at night. And as you walk in that the gate of that uh, fence, surrounding that, that fence, there's a sign that has the rules. And you're sort of entering the, the people's uh, territory there when you go into the park and the neighborhood's territory. Anyway, that's what, what I, I meant by that. And I realize describing all that in this would not make sense. But it's been something we've described for a long time. And, um, and we haven't really tried one in Albuquerque yet. Um, so that was the intention. But, I, I, you know, I, I understand. I have, I have run this language by the neighborhood. I don't think they have a chance to take a vote, but they were not opposed to it. Um, and what that looks like, I think, is maybe flexible to be determined what it really means, right? But but uh, I like that word urban in there because we don't we never we haven't looked at parks this way before, except for some of these little postage stamp type uh, 
parks that are really more concrete than park? Well, Mr. President and, and Councillor Benton, how about we how about we put such as an urban park? <laughs> That's fine. Listen, um, I, I'm okay with striking it okay. as long as you guys know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. President. So, Thank what you, is Councilor. the friendly amendment? We're just striking urban. Striking the word urban. I see, sort of clerks nodding. Okay, great. Um, well, I think yeah. Overall, I think. The, oh, Councilor Jones, I'm sorry. Thank you, Mr. President. Just, just one question here. Details, details, details. You know, that always makes us crazy, doesn't it? I, I'm, it's my understanding that we are not allowed to relinquish the park to the fire department until that is passed through the Parks Advisory Board. They have the, they are the final say on that. Um, and I just want to make sure before we start planning this in our heads that we can actually use this. So just want to bring up that one little technicality there. <laughs> it's a big one. Mr. Rayo. Mr. President and, and Councillor uh, Jones, you're correct. And we've, uh, we've already running that through the process um, so that we can make sure. If I may, Mr. Rayo, the Parks Board does not know you're running that through the process to them. They've not heard of it yet. Sounds like a fun meeting. Thank you. Yeah, and I think we've heard some other ideas as well. Um, some law enforcement folks have mentioned that um, for a while there's been some lobbying efforts, and it is Police Week, um, and our public safety folks to maybe build a more permanent and uh, robust uh, public safety memorial. Uh, I know we have our APD went up in the Northeast substation, but it's kind of puny. Um, and this would maybe be a great place to do that for all of our public safety if it, um, uh, service folks. I think, uh, I wonder if Chief Medina, I see him sort of nodding his head back there. I think there's a lot of opportunities to do in a more high-profile place if we're going to make this a center. So um, I think lots of opportunity and certainly stuff that will have to come back to the city council at some point for some approvals, uh, both for money and for design and uh, contracts. So we'll have another bite at that apple as well. Councilors, any other discussion on the amendment number five? I'm, oh, Councilor Jones, more? I'm sorry, just, just one more statement, and that is we obviously need to address this as a preliminary plan because we don't, this just came up tonight and we don't have much on it. So. Before I start getting phone calls, just understand that this is preliminary and it will come out with a final plan if we choose to do that. Thank you. Uh, all right, councilors, any other discussion on amendment number five as presented with the strike through? Thank you, chiefs. Seeing none, all those in favor of amendment five say yes. Any opposed? Seeing none, we'll call that nine zero. Councilor Bassan, I think we're back on your bill as amended five times. Mr. President, I'm, I'm happy with what we've created, and I appreciate everyone's work from what came from the administration to the collaboration with other counselors, and I think that a lot of people have had some say in this, so I urge your support. Councilor, seeing no other discussion on the bill, all those in favor say yes, raise your hand until the clerk can count us. Yes, that matter carries unanimously. Thank you. Councilor Bassan, you again, 123. Mr. President, R-123, Committee Substitute Appropriating Funds for Operating the Government of the City of Albuquerque for Fiscal Year 2024, beginning July 1st, 2023, and ending June 30th, 2024. Adjusting Fiscal Year 2023 Appropriations and Appropriating Capital Funds, I move a due pass. We have a second from Councillor Jones. Uh, Councillor Bassan, how do you, when we have public comment, which I think we ought to take first, I guess, and then we'll go to amendments, is that okay? So, Mr. Cornelius, would you take us through the honors? Thank you, Mr. President. Our first speaker is Jade Wasco, followed by Bernadette Hardy. Bernadette, come on down. I don't think the other person's here. It's good to see you in person again. Hey, everybody. I'm Bernadette Hardy with NAVA and uh, the International District Health and Communities Coalition. And we're, we're here to advocate to keep our buses free in the community. Um, we have lots of reasons. A lot of them, you've gotten emails for a lot. Um, many are, you know, just nothing's getting better. So we do, you know, rent increases. Um, there's, there's even, like, if you go down Lomas, there's no cars. So um, even no affordable cars, no affordable housing. So please keep in mind who it, this is affecting. 89% um, of, of our community is low income. So we do still need these buses for free. Um, we were recently asked to come to the city of Albuquerque Youth um, uh, uh, 
youth job fair, and we will be there. You know, we do our, our we do an internship at Neva. Uh, four out of our five students did take the bus every day, <laughs> but um, how are these kids going to get to these jobs? We just need to keep supporting the people who need it. We know the majority of people who commit these crimes are not. Are not are are not riding the bus. Um, just have faith that we are gonna we are gonna get better, and we need the, your support. Thank you. Thank you, Bernadette, for coming down tonight. Joseph Hernandez, followed by Andres Esquivel on Zoom. Mr. Hernandez, going once. We'll now go to Andres Esquivel on Zoom, followed by Anita Cordova. Hello, Council President and members of the, of the Council. Um, I'm Andres Esquivel. I am a organizer with the New Mexico Dream Team. I'm speaking in support of keeping the buses free. Um, I, myself, as an immigrant youth, was able to take the bus all the time uh, between high school and college. And I took advantage of the sticker that they give you at UNM when, when you're a student all the time. Um, so I think this would be something that would be very beneficial to all sorts, of, all sorts of youth, all sorts of people who definitely need these buses free. Um, thank you, and yeah. Anita Cordova, followed by Cesar Lazama. Good evening, counselors. My name is Anita Cordova, and I am speaking on behalf of Albuquerque Affordable Housing and Zero Fares Coalitions. I urge you tonight to vote on R23-123 in favor of $14 million in support of housing vouchers and into future budgets as a recurring investment. Full funding of service programs to sustain people in housing. Full funding to the transit department budget and the 3 million for zero fares to support program continuation and success. Now's the time to ensure every person has a place to live, that those places to live represent multiple types and varieties of housing for all people in our city, that we outreach to native communities and communities of color so that all people truly benefit from housing investments. Housing is a social and racial justice issue. As you know, many people in the Albuquerque community are already stretched thin, overpaying for rental housing where they are lucky to have it, and making impossible decisions between food, healthcare, clothes, medications, et cetera. Many of these same people are also transit dependent residents, seniors, families, essential workers, and people with disabilities who are directly benefiting from free transit and your housing plans. I and much of my family have grown up in Albuquerque, migrating from northern New Mexico towns to support the city's infrastructure via labor skills and to benefit from enhanced public services. They work and live here. Examples include my mother, a, a nurse for 50 years, lives with epilepsy and relies on public transportation. My uncle and his family live in the International District and have been underhoused for literally decades. With the discussions currently underway tonight, there is a chance to make this better, making quality housing that they can pay for available in their neighborhoods and accessible transportation to connect with family, entertainment, friends, and services in the city they love. A vote yes tonight can ensure that everyone can benefit from local programs and services that meet their basic human needs. Thank you. Cesar Lizama, followed by Joseph Hernandez on Zoom. Thank you, members of the council. My name is Cesar Lezama. I am a resident from District 7, and I am the economic justice organizer within the Mexico Dream Team. I join us today to express my support for the continuing of the zero fare programs. Public transportation put me through all of middle school and high school days. I, came from an, I come from an immigrant family, and especially during my school days when I couldn't have a job because I was a child, we had to squeeze every single dollar. I got $20 a week for allowance and expenses and $7 of so that went just for taking the four buses that I needed to take to and from school every single day. That was already with my student discount. Not only was it expensive and unreliable and underfunded, but it was the only option that we had, the only option that my family had. Now with free fares, 
with the possibility of increasing the budget for public transport, I can only imagine what my formative years would have looked like back then. And I am not alone. God knows I am not the only immigrant youth, essential worker, senior, low-income family, person with disabilities, whose life relies, whose lives rely on public transportation. Reliable, safe, and free public transportation is not a luxury of the future, but a necessity for today. And to ease the concerns raised by the Councilman Lewis and Councilman Los Angeles, I can assure you that there is not a vast organized crime network that has nefariously selected slow public buses that run on intermittent schedules as a means of escape for their next big hit. And furthermore, while I understand your fear about the truly devastating substance that is fentanyl, I'd like to cite the American College of Medical Toxicology and state that skin contact with fentanyl or fentanyl in the air will not lead to any adverse effects as it needs to enter your bloodstream. All that to say, please continue to fund the Zero First program and provide the public transit workers with the dignified pay that they serve. Thank you very much. Joseph Hernandez. Mr. President, members of uh, Albuquerque City Council, my name is Joseph Hernandez, and I am a, uh, a an, an enrolled tribal member of the Navajo Nation. Um, I had lived in Albuquerque for five years. Uh, I, I moved to Albuquerque specifically to, to go to school at uh, Southwestern Indian Polytechnic Institute, um, and I ended up... Uh, uh, you know, staying in Albuquerque, um, living on, on on the west side, and um, and I it's and uh, tribal institutions like SIPI are um, you know they, they they create meaningful impact for for city of Albuquerque you know, and and it gets uh, um, overseen. Um, I'm I'm really glad that. The uh, the city of Albuquerque finally put a bus bus shelter over at the uh, bus stop in front of Sippy. You know, I, I had worked on that when, when I was uh, a student over there, and they just put that in a couple years ago. And uh, I used to ride the, the the rapid ride, the 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 blue line. I'm sorry, the red line. And and I had classmates that were from UNM that would ride the bus to Sippy, and so the the free fares. Was something that we were trying to do as students, but we couldn't get to because you know yet you, you have to have a CNM or UNM I, uh, badge to, to ride the buses. But the free fares now give accessibility to all, all all students. You know everybody gets it. You know so you know it definitely has a a, a positive impact. And asking for uh, what I'm asking for is full funding. Uh, in, in in addition to you know. Uh, the, the the free fares. Um, I'm also speaking to you guys again uh, as a tribal member, um, understanding uh, Albuquerque's rich, uh, you know, um, history, and and especially, uh, you know, uh, the the relationship that the city of Albuquerque should have with tribes, with, with, with tribal leaders, uh, in, in making, uh, you know, any type of planning de de decision because. You know, we, we have a lot of historical, um, um, there, there's a, a lot of Mr. sacred sites. Mr. Hernandez, we appreciate you being yes. here with us this evening. We'll give you a chance to conclude your comments really quickly because you're our last public speaker this evening. Thank you for hanging okay. out with us. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, great. Um, again, appreciate uh, the, the, the work that you guys are doing, but we can do it better. In, in conclusion, um, I think it's important that, you know, uh, any type of um, uh, um, it, uh, planning that we, we also, uh, you know, can consider the, the tribal leaders thank in you, that sir. effort and moving forward. Uh, I just thank want to thank you again for allowing me to speak tonight. Thank you, thank Mr. You. Hernandez. All right, counselors, we are back on the bill. Uh, Councilor Bassan, anything before we go to amendments? We're just going to jump right in. Counselors, we are on Amendment A which we will call floor amendment number one, which is Councillor Bassan's, Madam Chair. Mr. President, uh, I would like to move floor amendment number one. This is a technical amendment. Uh, it was found after we had already done uh, the committee substitute and amendment number one in the committee. Uh, but some, some of the funding for arts and culture were already appropriated, and so we need to make that adjustment so that we don't overextend. 
Second count from Councillor Grout. Councillors, any question or discussion? Anything from the administration? That's a no. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand for amendment number one. Nine zero. Floor and our committee, well, I guess we'll call it floor amendment number two. This is uh, carried over from our last amendment. We'll take amendment B as mine. Uh, I move committee amendment number two. Um, this moves $150,000 from HR's risk recovery, uh, which was uh, identified by the administration as having some option for the purpose of conducting a feasibility study on the creation of public guarantee program to prevent homelessness and housing insecurity. Um, for those of you not familiar, we sort of glossed over this at our last meeting, but a guarantee program essentially um, provides a way for a third party like a nonprofit or a financial institution uh, to guarantee a person's credit uh, when they're applying for housing um, so that they can get over that hump and, uh, and establish themselves with permanent housing. And so I would move committee amendment number two. We have a second from Councilor Fiebecorn. Councilors, any questions on this item? Appreciate the administration's help in identifying a source for this. All those in favor of Amendment 2 say yes. Any opposed? No. 9-0. Uh, amendment number 3, Councillor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. I'll move floor, um, floor amendment number 3 um, on page 2, line 7, entitled Animal Care Center. Increase the amount by $40,000. Um, at the last meeting, we were really tight on budget, and two of my sponsorships had been dropped out accidentally, I'm told from the budget and I had taken 40K from the Animal Care Center to pay for those. I got a couple of mean calls. Um, I do not want to be known as the person that takes away money from the Animal Welfare Department, so I'm putting it back in because <laughs> we found additional money at the end of last meeting. So I'll move that amendment. Second for Councilor Brisson. I don't think anyone's ever accused you of taking money out of that pot. Um, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of Amendment 3 say yes. Any opposed? 9-0. Amendment 4, Councilor Feeblecorn. Thank you, Mr. President. This is floor amendment number 4, um, adding $30,000 on page 5, line um, 25 for strategic support for the um, B New Mexico sponsorship that was dropped from the budget from last year. So just re reinstating that sponsorship. Hey, Councilor Basson offers a second. Councilors, any other discussion? Anything from the administration? Seeing none, all those in favor of Amendment 4 say yes. That matter carries unanimously. We're on a roll, folks. All right, Councilor Fiebelkorn, five. Thank you, Mr. President. Floor Amendment number five, um, page three, line 25, Health and Human Services, increase the amount by $20,000. Again, reinstating a sponsorship that was dropped out of the budget accidentally for the grief center that provides um, services for young people who have lost their parents. Um, move this amendment. Second for Councilor Grout. Who could vote against that? Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes. Any opposed? 9-0. Councillor Grout. We're on 6. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, let's see here. The administration has asked me to pull this, and so tell me, tell me. <laughs> what? what? Let's do this. Do you want to sponsor it or do you want to ask the administration first? I want to ask the administration first. Mr. Real, comments on Pro Amendment F, which might be six. Mr. President and Councillor Grout, uh, first of all, um, you and I did talk on Friday about this project in particular. Mm -hmm. You did ask uh, my assistance in looking for funding to, um, uh, to support this effort. It did take me a while to get back, and I didn't get a chance to get back with you to, to tell you. Um, we have some funding that we've identified in our MR program, and there is some funding in transit as part of the art project that uh, we can do some directed funding to the East, Way, uh, East Gateway, if you will, MRA. And um, our concern is that this particular amendment takes half a million from ACS, and, um, and that department's already been, um, we've already asked them to, if you will, uh, hold funding for a period of time. Uh, this would really be a difficult um, situation for that department to carry out its mission, and particularly trying to go to 24-7. And so that's why I would ask if you would consider withdrawing it, and we'll work with you to ensure you, I say here publicly in front of your colleagues and in front of my staff, that we'll find the money for your East, Way, East Gateway project. Okay, thank you. Then, then I will um, not move it. 
Negotiations and live in progress. Councilors, Amendment H, which is now floor amendment number six. Thank you, Mr. Oh, thank okay. you, Mr. President. All right, I will move floor amendment number six on page two, line 23, uh, entitled early retirement, decrease the amount by 200,000. And on page five, line 31, entitled strategic support, increase the amount by 232,000. Um, this is a much streamlined version of the additional funding for staff for the planning department. Um, I think we heard that there was, you know, a large plan for um, a pretty aggressive unit. Um, when we really talk through with the planning department, what's really missing is um, an, an attorney and some staff to really work through problematic commercial properties that have kind of gone through the planning department, the code enforcement, maybe even gone through ADAPT and still have issues. Um, and so this would allow the planning department to work on those commercial projects or those commercial properties um, through that process of making sure that there's a, a, you know, community safety is included in that process. So with that, I'll move floor amendment number six. I'll second for the record. Councilors, any questions? Anything from the administration? No? Councilors, all those in favor of amendment six, item H. Say yes, raise your hand. And any opposed? That's nine zero. Um, Councillor Bassan, item, another item H, so whatever. Uh, floor amendment number seven, the long one. Mr. President, I would like to move floor amendment number seven. Uh, this amendment is to allow that the following appropriations are authorized and appro approved from the state of New Mexico grant and capital projects uh, from the 2023 state legislature. Uh, because of the way that everything is structured this year, we're able to actually obtain our funding faster if we do this. Great. Whatever I would be happy to have you ask administration further, but I think that's going to sum it up. Um, I'll second it for the record. Council Feeblecorn has a question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have one question um, on this very, very long list. Um, there is still $70,000 for Desert Hills acquisition. Um, I know our, our request was for millions of dollars and we got 70k and I was under the impression that those funds were going to be not accepted by the city um, so if we're going to be accepting them can somebody tell me what we're going to do with 70k for that building purchase that sounds like a Mr. Real question Mr. President and Councillor uh, Peeblecorn the 70k uh, obviously uh, was uh, originally our proposal to the legislature was to look at potentially acquisition etc for the site um, given the low amount that was funded, obviously that's not going to happen. Um, my sense would be is that there's an opportunity to look at the 70K for potentially, uh, if you will, um, looking at some safety measures or some improvements around the site and use the funding. The funding uh, language is pretty flexible and it might make the, us give us an opportunity to make the property more attractive uh, for a sale. Um, keep in mind, uh, we're not even close not sale, excuse me, for a potential redevelopment, if you will, of the site. So, I feel like there's a question. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. President. Yes, now I have a follow-up question. So we don't own the property, but we would spend the 70K to improve the property so that we could purchase it in the future? Uh, met, uh, Mr. President, Councillor Peeblecorn, but we own the right-of-way around the property. There might be some opportunities for us to improve the, the streetscape, et cetera, uh, any lighting issues, any situational issues that might improve or enhance the property. It is a vacant property. Um, the idea here is to look at using the funds for the pro opportunity to move a redevelopment effort there as opposed to the effort that we had originally proposed. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Mr. Rayo. Councilors, other questions? Councilor Bassan. Mr. President, good. thank you, Councilor Feeblecorn. Good catch. I don't, I, for the record, I absolutely feel very uncomfortable about accepting $70,000 from the state legislature for the Desert Hills acquisition in any way, shape, or form. Um, I don't know about the language on it. I never was in support of it being in some of the citywide priority requests in the first place. Um, so I don't want to hold up this entire bill with everything. However, what do, can we take it out, or do I just go on the record now of saying I 100% do not can, like, Mr. consent to that part as far as my one singular vote. Mr. Real, we could take it out and do it as a standalone at some point, right? But how do you want to proceed? Mr. President, you know, these are funds from the state legislature that are available to the city. So our opportunity, as stated in the introduction, was 
They were all funded by funding that's available July 1st. Uh, we listed all of the ones that came to us. If you all would prefer to take this one out and have it stand alone, um, certainly we can have that conversation at the point at that point. Mr. President, I would like to defer to the fellow colleagues up here on it. I know that you know the counselors that have been working on the acquisition of trying to find a youth shelter and finding somewhere to do never were fully on board with even even this proposition in the in the first place. So, um, you know if. I'm very hesitant to accept these funds from the state, given the past and what we've had happen with many other things that have come to light of late. So um, I would prefer that we take it out uh, and then pass the rest of it. Let the state have the 70,000 for all I care. All right. So it's the sponsors kind of by request, but it's your preference. So Councillor Kraut. Mr. President, if I Mr. might just one make one final comment. Um, um, for as much as this particular issue might be of a challenge for all of us, um, in some ways or other, I just keep in mind these are legislators who um, are trying to help the city, and sponsors might be, we might need to talk to our sponsors of this particular bill just to ensure that they don't feel like they put some money up that uh, now we're, we're not interested in accepting, um, but uh, we'll have that conversation when this uh, when we talk about this. Yes, but Mr. Al, I might remind us that last time somebody sponsored something that didn't kind of go through the process, it kind of got everybody in trouble and it's in Rio Rancho. So maybe we could revisit and do that as a standard. Seriously. <laughs> Councilor Pena. Mr. President, I was gonna say, I think it's just a standard process. I think the only yeah. reason we're doing it now is because we're having the money that's available yeah. sooner. Um, I can understand Councilor Brisson's um, reservations, but I think at the end of the day, the money is allocated to the city, so at next legislative session, Councilor Cablecorn can ask for a reauthorization of those dollars. It's up to the sponsor at the moment. She's asked for it to be removed. Mr. So. President, I don't, I don't know if Councilor Cablecorn is at your lift, but I definitely think that it can be reappropriated. However, um, you know, if we can get staff to go ahead and work on making sure to designate it, that's fine. I don't feel comfortable accepting it like this. So I'm willing to not hold up this bill and screw up everything with that, but then we need to make sure that somehow the scope of this is expanded so that we are safe in what we're doing and it's not going to be used on the Desert Hills acquisition or on the Desert Hills property, but instead city right of way near Desert Hills. So if, if staff can work on that and we can get that done soon, then I'm, I'm okay with that. I see nods. Oh. Well, I'll say, Councilor Fiebelkorn, you were named. Do you want to weigh in? Um, sure. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Bisson. I, you know, I just, um, I think it's a problem that we continually see at the legislature is that we ask for ten million dollars and we get seventy k. And I just worry that um, if we accept this, these funds and use it for something that's kind of adjacent but not on there, without telling the state, without telling the sponsors, it just seems. Um, not really transparent um and and i you know I, it's no it's no secret that i did not appreciate this request to begin with but given that we only got this amount i i'm happy with the answer of like let's think through how to work with the sponsors work with the state to make sure it's allocated to something near there but i i just want to make it very clear that we are not um, bankrolling money of 70k to purchase a piece of property that no one wants to purchase so Thank you. Councilor Sanchez, briefly. Thank you. I just think that was an excellent catch. Thank you, Councilor Feeblecorn, and thank you for that transparency issue. I appreciate it. So where are we, Councilor Basan? Mr. President, uh, Mr. President, we're at moving forward with Amendment 7, and staff is going to work at helping us fine-tune and limit the scope so that it can be more transparent, accountable, and trustworthy later. Thank you. So we're moving in. I urge your support. Yep. Councilors, any other discussion and anything else from the administration? Mr. President, I, on this particular issue, just one more last point to both Councilor Feeblecorn and Councilor Bassan's concerns. Uh, keep in mind that uh, any f uh, use of these funds has to go back to the state to get a notice of obligation and approval for use of the funds so that you both know and the council know and Councilor Sanchez in particular. Um, whatever is proposed to be utilized with the funds have to be in line with what the appropriation and the language and the DFA would have to approve that in the process. So just to give you that perspective of it. 
So moving forward with Amendment 7 as written with no change. All those in favor say yes. Raise your hand. And that matter carries 8-0 for the record. Councilor Benton is excused for the remainder of the meeting. Uh, next up, uh, Councilor Basson, by request floor amendment number 8, which is item I in your packet. Mr. President, floor amendment number 8 is on page 4, line 2, entitled Office, Office of Equity and Inclusion Increase the Amount by 280000 On page 4, line 6, entitled Strategic Port Support Decrease the Amount by 280000 Second from Councilor Feeblecorn. Councilors, any discussion? Uh, I'm sorry, Councilor Payne, did you have something? Oh, Mr. Real. Mr. President, um, at the last council meeting, uh, we had a conversation about this particular matter. I, I want to take the opportunity to first and foremost to say to thank you to Councilor Bassan for this particular amendment tonight. Um, I know this issue is uh, an important issue for the city, but uh, I appreciate uh, Councilor Bassan's uh, uh, work on this particular matter uh, really helps get that department uh, to doing what it needs to do. And look, um, we had a, uh, a lot of challenging issues in our, our community and, and your funding and your restoring of this fund is much appreciated to that, to, to that community and to, the, to that department. Thank you so much. Councilors, any other discussion on floor amendment number eight? Seeing none, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand, please. That is eight nothing. Floor amendment number nine, Councilors Grout and Jones. Audit. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Um, floor amendment number nine to Committee Seb R23123. This amendment increases the um, IA and Inspector General Office for the purpose of providing a salary increase for the IA and IG, a salary adjustment of 62805 for the IG and 58 79 for the IA was recommended by the Accountability and Government Oversight Committee. The amount will come from the Department of Finance Strategic Support Program Strategy. Council Jones, I'm sure you're a second. Mr. Bakta, I know you have a comment. I think you do. Council President uh, Davis and Councilor, since you insist, I think I'll have a comment. <laughs> you agree uh, with the mic. So we just talked about today you know, the, the disparity in uh, salaries, we have roughly 6,000 employees, about 240 of them make more than $100,000. IG's position is one of them. Uh, internal audit's position is one of them. Uh, <clears throat> we also agreed just last week, uh, by way of uh, Resolution 23-122, when we added an, ob an objective that, uh, the first position that the class and comp study will evaluate would be the IG and internal auditor's position. So I think this is a little confusing to me uh, why we are, uh, you know, giving the raise uh, and not waiting for that class and comp study. Also, I want to remind that uh, that particular study that you're considering right now is basically a self-study. I mentioned that before. It's something that with IG came up on her own, and as far as I understand, AGO did not vote on that. I, I highly recommend the councillors to reach out to other members of the AGO as well to discuss how this transpired. I think in light of uh, uh, the disparity in uh, pay, I'll just give you a couple of examples. The blue collar supervisors at transit, uh, for example, very hard to fill position of mechanics, we just lost some mechanics uh, three weeks ago. Uh, the supervisor makes sixty-five thousand dollars and supervises eight people. Uh, at uh, Solid West, uh, there are drivers and their supervisors. The supervisor supervises fifteen drivers and makes sixty-five thousand dollars. So I think, is this the priority that we want to give raise based on self-study? and not wait for the class and comp study. Uh, the irony is not lost on me that <laughs> just the discussion we had earlier today is in complete contrast with what's being proposed here. So I urge your uh, support not to give this raise. I'm not against the raise, but I'm, I I'm highly encourage you to wait for an independent study and not a self-study. This is very self-serving. Thank you.
Thank you, Mr. Bakta. Counselors, other questions before we go back to the sponsors? I'm sort of inclined to agree with Mr. Bakta that I think we should do that in kind and we can always go back and make the modification if necessary mid-year or wherever it's at. But I'm interested to hear from the sponsors. So to close, I think. I urge your support. Okay. Counselors, all those in favor of Amendment 9, raise your hand, say yes. One, yes. two, three, four, five, six, seven. And I'm a no. So seven one. With one absent, right? Okay. Um, and then we have floor amendment number 10, Councillor Pena. Um, thank you, Mr. President. I think we have to make a, a motion to suspend the rules first in order to hear this amendment. We have a motion to suspend to allow the late introduction of the amendment. All those in favor, say yes and raise your hand. That is unanimous 8-0. Councilor Pena, on your bill or on your amendment. Thank you. So um, this would be floor amendment number 10. On page two, after line two, insert the following. The amount of 100000 is reserved for wage adjustments for city employees making less than $15 an hour. The amount would increase the wages for those employees to at least $15 per hour. The amount would be distributed to the respective departments and programs by the Office of Management and Budget. Budget. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Councillor Feeblecorn with a second. Councillor Pena, go ahead. Anything else? Um, urge your support. And Councillor Jones. Just one question. Is $100,000 enough to make, to raise the money for all the people, to raise the wages for all the people making Mr. less Mr. Munoz 15, is nodding. 15. According to our budget, according to our budget staff. Mr. Yes. Munoz is nodding. Ms. Yara is at the table. Mr. Bach is nodding. So whoever wants to answer this question. Yes, uh, Mr. President and Councilors, I, uh, $100,000 we think is enough to uh, to make this amendment work. We we weren't sure what the final calculation of the COLA would be, so we hadn't um, had done a preliminary guess, but it was much more when it, we were only proposing a 2% COLA, so I think this will handle it. I just want to maybe ask for a friendly amendment. Um, to say that this would only apply to full and part-time workers and not seasonal or temporary workers. Otherwise, it'll cost us a lot more. Yes. Councillor Pena agrees, and the clerk can make that note in the final. Councillor Jones, anything further? No, thank you. Thanks for the clarification, and thank you for that addition. Councillor Feeblecorn with a question. Thank you, Mr. President. So. Um, I, I thought I heard earlier um, that there were three types of temporary employees and that one, one type is just a regular employee that can be um, working for the city for up to two years. Are those folks not going to be included in this? Ms. Shar. Um, Mr. President and Council of Feeblecorn, no, they wouldn't be included here. We consider them temporary workers. Uh, and, and temporary or seasonal workers don't um, would cost us a lot more. It would cost about $2 million to do that. So, Mr. President, we have that many temporary two-year employees that are making under $15 an hour that it would cost millions of dollars to pay A lot them? of our temporary workers that I'm talking about are the seasonal employees that work during the summer. So all of the, the lifeguards, right. the community service. So. We have about 1,000 employees uh, more in the summer than we do off season. Thank you. So I, I must have misunderstood when Mr. Ramirez was here earlier when he said there are three types of, of temporary employees. One was seasonal, one was student, and then there was one that was just full-time employees that worked for two, uh, for two years. Did I misunderstand yes. those three categories? Oh, um, Mr. President and Council Feeblecorn, uh, Director Romero was talking about our temporary workers under contract with temporary t uh, staffing agencies. They're only allowed to work for us for two years and then they have to roll off? Okay. Yeah. So those are temporary workers working off of contracts with third parties. Off contracts. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. Other questions, Councilor Payne? Anything further? Councilors, all those in favor of Amendment 10 say yes. Raise your hand, please. That is 8-0. Councilors, we are back on Council Basson's bill as amended and substituted many, many times. 
Mr. President, again, I appreciate uh, all of the lessons learned, the hard work put in, the compromises made, the additions, the subtractions, the frustrations, the blood, sweat, and tears, but I, I mean, theoretically. Um, and I'm glad that we're, we're at somewhere where I think the majority of everybody got a little bit of something and lost a little bit of something. So I urge your support. Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Real. Mr. President, I, if I might just say on behalf of the administration that we appreciate it working with Councillor Bassan um, and, um, and all the councillors uh, as we develop this budget. <laughs> One of my traditions has always been, councillors, is that right before you vote on the budget is to share with you a little ice cream to cool you off after a long evening. So if you wouldn't mind, I'm going to have uh, Libby just give out some ice creams. And this year, Councillor... Uh, <laughs> Councillor Feeblecorn, we, we've got a non-dairy uh, treat for you, just in light of the fact of what happened last year. Mr. But, President, I'm so impressed with that. Thank you very much. <laughs> but anyway, Councillor Bassan, thank you so much for your help and your work on this. Um, I think it worked out, and we appreciate the Council's support. Thank you, Mr. Al. I will say, uh, while we're doing this piece, uh, and for those of you, thank you. Thank you for those of you noticing whether the administration and council can work better together. We do do things better with food and ice cream, so that's a good note. Um, but Councilor Bassan, you've done an excellent job this year. We've had a lot of years where there was a lot of fighting, um, and we had midnight meetings, and we extended this to the last possible minute and passed the deadlines. Um, you managed to make this one work really well with the administration this year, so thank you for not having us here till midnight tonight. I'm grateful for that in and of itself. Um, Councilor, seeing no other discussion, uh, and everyone well fed, Councilor Lewis. Does this final vote? It will be, yeah. Oh, okay. But so go ahead. Let me just say. Um, it is the final vote. Right? Yeah. Okay. Um, I do appreciate, I, I, this is primarily the mayor's budget, and I, I do appreciate all the work and the, the amendments and uh, you know, Councilor Brisson's work on this and going through the process, but it's generally, you know, how it started, and, and it, it does have, uh, you know, quite a, Quite a big reduction to economic development. I think there's some lack of foresight and vision there in economic development. Uh, just not the director, not the people, but I think the budget um, uh, with a pretty significant reduction in, in funding over last year. Uh, this budget cuts police officers, funding to police officers. It cuts senior affairs uh, department, uh, reduces funding to animal welfare shelters. Uh, it increases ACS by 46%, while increases to AFR at 8.3%. Um, APD at 0.8%, uh, while ACS handles just a small fraction of emergency calls, increases funding to transit by 44%, um, and uh, without a whole lot to show for it. So um, I do believe that the, the, um, the priorities um, uh, are just, uh, you know, not reflected, I think, in a way that really honors, you know, taxpayer dollars in this budget. And I've discussed it, talked about it, asked a lot of questions, shared my concerns over the course of uh, the budget process and wanted to make sure uh, you knew why be voting against it. Thank you. Any other discussion? And seeing none and the councilor having closed, all those in favor of R123 as amended, raise your hand and say yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All those opposed, one. So that matter carries seven to one with one excused. Uh, and Councilor Lewis, you have uh, the last bill of the evening. Hey, Mr. President, R138 is established in the City Council President of, of, of their designee as the City Representative on the Board of, uh, on the Albuquerque Regional Economic Alliance Board of Directors. I move it to fast. Several seconds from oh, Councilor Payne, Councilor Lewis. And Mr. President, so uh, there's an amendment as well. It's just a small amendment that just uh, clarifies the language. Basically, this bill just says that uh, along with the membership of area, uh, that, um, uh, it, I mean, originally it says that the, it's the council president or his designee, his or her designee, um, and, and this, the amendment just clarifies and says, or, or a member of the council, basically a member of the council that the, the president uh, designates. And so that's what the amendment does. I move the amendment. So you have a second on the amendment from several councilors? The clerk could pick her favorite. The amendment. Yep. All those in any discussion, seeing none, all those in favor of the amendment, say yes. And back on the bill. And Ms. President, I urge your support for the bill. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Again, establishes that a member of this council would serve as a board member of area. 
along with the membership that we just approved in our budget. Thank you, Councilor Lewis. Seeing no other discussion, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. That bill carries unanimously. There being no other business before this council, we're done ahead of time. Good job. We will see you all on June 5th. I don't want to be.